Boom, 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 boom. Boom! What's going on, everybody? Oh my God, this this is an exciting one. This is a uh, this is a massive one for for this channel. Um, tonight we are watching Terminator Two: Judgment Day. Now, if you're noticing over in the chat room, there is a poll going uh, where you can vote yes or no. Uh, is Terminator 2 Judgment Day James Cameron's greatest film? That is the question. I feel like a, not to discredit your question, but a good question would also be, is Terminator 2 the best sequel? See, that's a little too broad. I want to kind of keep it in the James Cameron canon. Okay. So is this his greatest film? Yes or no? Make sure you're voting over in the poll. It's going to stay up the entire time. And then at the end, we're going to tally up the votes and we're going to see, do people agree? Is this the greatest James Cameron movie or is there a better one out there? Uh, let us know. So, okay, that business aside, let's get into the juicy part because we're not doing this alone. No, no, no. We we had to go all out for Terminator 2 because it's one of our favorite films. I mean, it's one of my favorite films. And, and yeah, I, mean, I know it's you, up there. It's up there. yeah. So had to go all out for this one. So we have a stacked panel of guests and uh, we're actually currently working with one to get them in here so fingers crossed that's going to happen if not we're going to try to figure out something i don't know we're going to have to improvise um so we're going to work from the back and we're going to go all the way up to the front so we're going to save the absolute best for last um the big catch for the night um but we're going to start with someone who is a staple here on the channel someone who is the go-to he's the goat in a way uh, when it comes to anything Arnold Schwarzenegger related, and yes, we're going to get into the chat. We're going to say hi to everybody. The comments are going to pop up. We're going to have a good time, but we're going to bring in the guests first. So uh, we're going to bring in Arnold Schwarzenegger's biggest fan, I think. I think he's Arnold's biggest fan. Yeah, I think fan. that's an objective statement. I mean, maybe Casey. Maybe Casey. We're, uh, we're going to see. They're going to battle it out here. Uh, so let's bring him in. First and foremost, it's our good friend, Durant Cinema. Hopefully he has a mirror with him. Yo, what is going on, guys? How are we doing today? How is it going? I'm going to feel so out of place right now, Ed and Haley. <laughs> and it's going to be insane. Well, because like you got all these great people coming on here, and then you just got this guy. You. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Even my wardrobe doesn't make any sense. I got Terminator 1, but I figured to throw on that uh, that leather jacket. Yeah. on the stream for t2 so Absolutely. but either way i'm i'm excited uh thank you for having me on here this is this is gonna be amazing uh, yeah, just been anticipating and uh i got chills and they're multiplying so All right. let's go Sweet. um i think the last time you watched this movie was like six months ago right on another watch along <laughs> yes yes <laughs> exactly um, based off of that background, I, I think it's safe to say you might be arnold's biggest fan but now we're gonna bring in someone Oof. else are you familiar with T for Two, the Terminator Two show? No, I am not. No. Okay. So this is gonna be great. This is gonna be great because uh, this may be Arnold's biggest fan. We're gonna have bring to bring him in game. here. Bring him in. All right, you said it. We're bringing in Casey Stelkin, aka the creator of T for it's Two, the Terminator Two I show. Was... Oh, sorry, I'm late. I was popping some popcorn since you know this is the greatest popcorn flick in, in the history of cinema. <laughs> uh, I got to say, though, between myself and Mr. Durant, I don't think we're going to be battling over who's the biggest no. Arnold fan, but who deserves less to be here. Because I feel like I do not deserve to be here. <laughs> so you may be saying that you are at the bottom here, but I'm at the bottom. I'm at the bottom. No, no, no. no with that background, man, that background alone, you win. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, it's not it, just like in uh, photography. It's not about the, the stuff. It's about the lighting. So it's it's just yeah. because I got a bunch of blue lights. It makes stuff look way better than it does. We're, we're going to be like stepbrothers and be like, did we just become best friends? <laughs> uh, but look, Dave, go yeah. check out. And everybody, seriously, like everybody, please go check out uh, Casey's channel, T for Two. It's a phenomenal show. Okay. Um, and it's all dedicated to Terminator 2. So That's um, excellent. Of it. it's it's a it's a phenomenal uh, channel. I've had both of you guys on the podcast before. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to see if Michael is commenting. No, I don't see him in the in the studio here. So okay, we're gonna wait. Um, all right, this next guest we're bringing in here. I uh, I have it right here. I'm gonna make ourselves full screen for just a second. Uh, so this is a author that I have had on the podcast uh, before. And uh, he has written a crap ton of books 
on a dip, like a bunch of different filmmakers, but obviously my favorite is James Cameron. And he wrote this phenomenal book right here. James Cameron, a retrospective. This thing oh. is gorgeous. Look oh at my God. It's, oh my God, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, so we're going to be bringing in Ian Nathan to the channel for the first time. Here All he right. is. Right there. Hey guys. There he is. I've oh, got very know. inadequate because I've got this kind of pale white kind of Kubrick like background. Everybody seems to be, you know, completely in style. Yeah, I'm <laughs> kind of plant. Um, so I, I like it. A little bit like I've not done the aesthetics properly. I'll have to make up for it with kind of what I say, but you know. It's kind of late here. I'm, I'm on UK time. It's London. So you're going to have to bear with me. I've been pumped up with coffee and I'm ready to go. There you go. I'm not off. Does someone shout at me? You know. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> Ian, it's good to see you again. Uh, the last time I Pleasure. talked to you was a few years back on the Terminator 101 podcast. So uh, it's been a little bit, but I'm happy you're here, man. And look, I love, I love this book. I know this is like, thank this you. is your newest book that you've released, right? It is indeed. Yes. Yeah. So you know, thank you. Go get it. Go get it. It's on Amazon. Yes. It's, it's, it's yeah. everywhere books are. Cool. Um, so let's see. We're going to be bringing in. Uh, I don't think Michael's getting back. To, all right. Well, we're going to wait for Michael, but we're going to be bringing in. Okay. This is the, the, the big guest tonight. This is somebody who worked directly on the film. This is uh, Jeff Don. He is an Academy Award winning makeup artist. He won the Best Makeup Academy Award with Stan Winston for Terminator 2. So all those all those makeup effects that are on Arnold and and uh, when the T-1000 pierces uh, uh, Todd's mouth, all that stuff, that is the, uh, I'm pretty sure that's, that's all compliments of Jeff Don, uh, of course, working with the team that he was assembled with. Um, but here he is, we even have a drum roll for him because he deserves a drum roll. So here he comes. Are you ready? I don't think you are. It's Jeff Don, hey. everybody. Hello, everybody. There he is. Boy, after after that introduction, I better tell some good stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. And uh, this is the exact same background I remember because uh, the last time we talked was a few years back as well. But I'm pretty sure that it's the same yeah, room. It's the same spot. I do a lot of interviews, a lot of podcasts and, 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 and uh, Zooms here. Yes. Oh, my God. Place. I love it, Jeff. I love it. Who doesn't love um, it? All right. So let's see. Let's see. What should we do first? We're going to get into some comments here. We're going to see who is joining us tonight. Uh, we're not going to get to everybody because I'm sure there's a lot of people in the chat tonight. Um, but we're just going to say hi to a few people that were here early on. We got Adrian James saying hello. Bob, hello. This is going to be fun, says Bob. Yes, yes. I, I yes. hope it is. The Infiltrator. Hi, guys. I'm so excited. Welcome, Mr. Infiltrator. Have you seen this boy? Um, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, say that's a nice bike. <laughs> uh, Hey Ed, Haley, Dave, and everyone else. Hello, Tony. Uh, I'm new to you guys, but I'm a huge fan of the Terminator franchise, specifically T2. Hell yes. Right on. Well, we love having you here. So hopefully you'll stick around. You'll stick around. Uh, love T2. T2 is great. Uh, Oliver, what's going on? Oliver has been a big supporter of this uh, live stream. He's been promoting it. So. Uh, love you, Oliver. Thank you for that, man. Uh, we got Jared saying okay. hello to everybody. I think we even got T for two in here. It's some like meta thing going on here. Oh, damn. You're ready to <laughs> Judd, what's going on, Judd? Uh, Laren doing the boom thing. And welcome, Jeff, Michael, Ian, Casey, and David. And a special thank you to Mr. Peter Kent. Yes, I think that's a perfect segue. Thank you for saying that, Laren. Uh, so initially, I reached out to Peter Kent, who is Arnold's official stunt double, uh, from from the years 84 to 96. And I reached out to him because he uh, also was on the Terminator 101 podcast back in the day. And unfortunately, the times did not line up. Uh, I'm pretty sure he's on a vacation right now, but he did send a special video that he recorded to be played right here. Uh, so we're going to do that. We're going to play that. And, nice. uh, and then we're going to get ro rocking and rolling here. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, not live, but sort of live, Mr. Peter Kent. Hey guys, I'm Peter Kent, uh, former stuntman Arnold Schwarzenegger in many of his movies, uh, especially in T2, uh, where you're seeing my bike jump and uh, truck transfer and uh, quite a few other gags. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there. Just wanted to say hi and I'll give you a shout out uh, to Eddie and to uh, my old buddy Jeff Don. Uh, <laughs> hey Jeff, 
who applied the makeup to me, uh, the uh, dreaded mask, which I wore for the very first time in that movie. And uh, I think about 66 or more consecutive days of having that thing hellishly glued to my face. Uh, Jeff, uh, I curse your name still. <laughs> Hope you guys are well. Enjoy the movie. Uh, it was a pleasure to work on it. It still is. Um, they're using my clip for the Rolex uh, uh, campaign now for uh, the Academy Awards for special effects in the commercial. So uh, it, it lives on. And it is an incredible piece of work by all parties involved. Cheers, guys. Once again, Peter Kent, out. All right. That was awesome. There he yeah. is, Peter Kent. Uh, Jeff, can you talk to us just a, just a little bit about Peter? Because obviously you worked with him. So we're going to make you full screen here. Anything you want to say about Peter? Well, Peter has been a friend of mine since we first met on Terminator 1. I remember... Um, our casting people were desperately looking for a photo slash stunt slash um, stand in for Arnold. And they came, this guy came to the set one night. Uh, this was one of the first nights we were filming Terminator one in 84. And uh, here comes this big, tall, muscular guy that had some similar look to Arnold. Peter is taller than Arnold leaner, but he is very well built. He always was. And um, Peter is also very, very intelligent. Um, Peter, you're probably listening to this. So yes, it's a compliment, which I don't like to typically do for you. But um, that's the way guys talk to each other, I guess. Anyways, Peter ended up being the stand-in, photo double, stunt double. Arnold had many stunt doubles throughout his movies, including Peter um, and uh, Joel Kramer and uh, uh, um, Billy Lucas. But Peter did some pretty death-defying stunts over the years with on Arnold films that I was there for. I actually went to the hospital, I think twice with Peter to get this mask, which just imagine you have a prosthetic that goes on just like this all the way around and it makes him look like Arnold. You know, the nose, the chin, the whole bit, it really made him look much more like Arnold. And um, when he was injured, I would go to the hospital with him so that I could take it off because people didn't know what it was. How do you take this off? What is it made of? Are there glues that should be a concern? So I ended up doing that several times with stunt doubles, including at least twice with Peter. So Peter, if you're watching this, I, I respect you. You've done some death-defying things. I consider you a good friend till death. There you go. Yeah, no, uh, Peter was, uh, when I was able to talk to him, you know, he was he was just very informative and uh, uh, he, like he, you can tell, even though he is retired, I know he does, uh, he. He does a stunt school, right? To my knowledge. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He so he still is teaching this stuff to people up and coming. So uh, it's it's absolutely incredible. He's up in Canada, so um, it's just uh, uh, really appreciate you, Peter. If you are watching this, thank you for sending that clip in that we were able to play just to kind of get you involved somehow uh, with this with this show tonight. So uh, there is Peter Kent, and uh, we'll just say hi to a couple more people, and then we're going to get the movie rocking and rolling here. Movie collector, I love yes. this movie. The VHS, the DVD, the Blu-ray. James Cameron loves you. Uh, <laughs> let's see here. Some new people. We got Ramen Nudes. Yes, but James Cameron has all bangers. Oh, I guess you might be talking about that poll. Um, they are all great films. They are all great yes. films. Uh, yes, The Infiltrator, you have a lot of hot toys. Very cool. Question, is this movie better than... What is this? Is this movie... More better than T intact. T intact. I don't know what that means, Judd. I mean, I don't Clar one. Clarify your question. Is it better than T one? Is that the question? I don't know. How do we feel? Well, Jeff, you're biased because you worked on both of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is my opinion? Yeah, yeah. It's interesting because T one, of course, is very dated. Still, it still holds up, but it's much more dated than T two. It was done for what 6.4 million and Terminator 2 was something like 90 or 100 million. Um, so that that shows up. And yeah. um, because Terminator 1 was the first in that whole franchise, many people think it's their favorite. T2 is often because it was the number one box office. It won so many Academy Awards. Everyone knows it and loves it around the world. I leaned to T2 just because it's such an interesting film even to this date. I was just watching it. Uh, it's been years since I've seen it, and damn, it's a good film. So T2 for me. T2. What about you, Ian? It's a, it's a tough question to answer. I, I suppose my answer probably is T2 because the storytelling, 
the daring of it, the, the comedy of it, the way it elevates and, and it makes increasingly ironic the idea of Arnold, all the kind of the cleverness. But you don't get Terminator 2 without the Terminator. You don't get James Cameron's career without the Terminator. And there's something very pure about the original and compelling. And it, yeah, it has dated technologically, but it's a piece of kind of linear chase story, storytelling. Yep. It's still pretty, pretty amazing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Casey, I think you're pretty uh, biased. <laughs> well, actually, uh, to be honest, I, I, I don't really participate usually in conversations about which one is better because to me it, it, there it's like chapter one and chapter two of one whole perfect finished story. It, it's, I mean, obviously I had nothing to do with making them. I was a little kid, but it, to me, it's almost, almost like picking between my favorite of my two children, you know? Yeah. Um, and of course my favorite child would be Terminator two. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Like <laughs> Casey, you took the words right out of my mouth. I was like, it's like literally picking your favorite child. Yep. It, it, it's so tough because like I was always a T2 person for the longest time, but I just caught myself watching Terminator 1 more often. And I, I think it's more rewatchable, but T2, I think is a better movie. So I'm, I'm the same way. I'm like, you know what? Why decide they're both tied in my book? So yep. that's where I stand. Uh, Bob says, I think Casey is the only person with more copies of this movie than me. <laughs> uh let's see here all right so there's a lot of comments we're gonna we're gonna sporadically get to them as the night goes on um but we do want to get this movie started if for no other reason than ian did say it is very late where he is so <laughs> yeah <laughs> we want to uh we want to make sure he gets some some sleep tonight so uh for anybody watching if you are going to be watching along with us we are watching the theatrical version there are yes. to my knowledge there's three versions of this movie and we're watching the, the, uh, the, the theatrical. It is the shortest, the tightest, um, but the other editions do add in really cool uh, features, at, you know, extra scenes. Uh, we're just not going to be talking about those tonight. So we are watching the theatrical. So make sure you have that queued up. Um, we have uh, this uh, gorgeous Blu-ray signed by Mr. Robert Patrick when I met him in person. Uh, he couldn't be here tonight, unfortunately. <laughs> Damn it. Damn it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, so we are literally at zero. We have a black screen. If we okay. were to press play keyword, if, if we were to press play, Carol Co comes across the screen. It does that nice little zigzag uh, yeah. logo. So that's where we are. We'll give everybody a couple, a uh, couple seconds to get lined up there. Everybody in the panel should be lined up though. Um, we're just going to quickly go around and then we're going to start the movie. Dave, the last time you watched this was six months ago. Uh, correct. Yes. Okay. Casey, when, when when was the last time you watched it? Uh, it's probably been a few years, honestly. I'm constantly going through and skimming through to cut clips out for my yeah. show. So, like, I'm seeing bits of it constantly. So, I haven't sat down and watched it for probably since before I started the show. Perfect. Sweet. Ian? It's probably been about a year and a half. I watched it about three times when I was writing the book. So, it's still pretty clear in my mind. But it's been, a, yeah, about a year and a half since I last watched it in full. All right. And Jeff? Um, I watch I watched the first hour of it starting about an hour ago. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> so, I will. Uh, when we get to the second half, I'm sure many things will come up. I will be chiming in here a lot because uh, when I watched the first hour, I went, "Oh, that story, that story, that story." I got a lot <laughs> of stories to tell here. That's uh, perfect. Awesome. Buried in the trivia and such, and IMDb, and I'm sure your book and other things. You, you're going to be an expert on this stuff. Because I, I can tell you what happened on the day on the spot from my eyeballs and ears. You know, all the other behind the scenes stuff I'm not that familiar with unless I were to research it. Perfect. That's okay. perfect. Now, that's that's exactly what we want to hear. Uh, quick update. I just want to see if uh, uh, Michael is saying anything here. I do believe he got back to me. I have you on my screen, but I don't think you can hear me. Um, I don't see you. Um, I don't think he's in. He's not in here with me. Um, can you just quickly maybe type um, something here? Because uh, I just want to get the thing yeah. rocking and rolling here. All right, so we're going to count down and we're going to let Jeff Bless count you. us down because he is the uh, the super duper special guest. Everybody tonight is a super special guest, but he is uh, a super duper. So we're going to count down from three, two, one. And when Jeff says play, we're going to hit our play buttons. So okay. Jeff, take it away. Okay, three, two, one, play. Perfect. All right. There it is, baby. I'm looking at the horse. 
you're looking at a horse. The horse, <laughs> the, yeah. The, the uh, so he'll be a few seconds behind. Star. Yeah, because we have the Carol Co. Yeah, uh, thing coming up. I can speed it up or slow it down by ten seconds easily here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speed it up. Get to that Carol Co. thing. I'm at Carol yeah. Okay, now it says Mario Casar. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now we got intense yeah, music. There. L.A. Yes, in the traffic. The, yeah, the goddamn traffic. <laughs> oh yeah. Gotta, gotta love it. <laughs> I just said uh, maybe I should say something up front. What I think That's so important about show. what makes a Terminator movie work, and, and Jeff will probably back this up, is they have to be set in L.A. L.A. is a character in these films. And, you know, when they kind of the sequels and prequels, whatever they did kind of took it away from LA. I thought you're losing essential kind of backbone of what Terminator is. You know, it's about Arnold, it's about time traveling cyborgs, it's about Sarah Connor, but actually it's also about LA and Cameron's kind of view of LA. And the idea of LA is a movie city. And that's what makes it sort of doubly realistic. Of course, now we've got the future wars, but you know, LA just seems so important to me in terms of what the, the Terminator aesthetic is. It's true. I mean, Jim moved from Canada to L.A. and started his career there with Harvey Corman, with um, um, Roger Corman, Harvey Corman. And um, so this was comfortable to him. We shot so much of this in the San Fernando Valley, which is a valley just north of, of Los Angeles. And, um, you know, this is it is very, very L.A. for both movies. Yep. And now and just so uh, we're all synced up, we just had that beautiful pan up of the endoskeleton. Yeah. OK, okay. cool. Yes. Cool. Can anyone hear anybody's thing? Can, like, I, I can't hear uh, anyone. No, no. I have the sound okay, down. Good. good, good. So wasn't it correct that the, the Future Wars is filmed at, a, at an old factory? It was a disused factory where they just found a lot of the rubble was already there. So you just sort of went, well, we can just start shooting here because it looks kind of like a ragged dystopian future already. There he is. Yes, we filmed a lot of it down at an old Kaiser plant that had been... Uh, shut down and they were going to tear it apart and send all the all the equipment to uh, to china so we had free reign of the the entire area for several weeks including of course the the crucial steel stuff that we do so i think this is absolutely the perfect time um because somebody just entered the studio and we are about to see him on the screen so this is absolutely oh, perfect. wow yeah. Like perfect timing. I think you might have done this on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, for it. So, ladies and gentlemen, oh. we can see on the screen right now. We can see this uh, behind this uh, behind the shoulder shot of a uh, gentleman who is old John Connor. This is John Connor in the future, looking through the binoculars, and now we get that beautiful close close up zoom. Oh yes. So we're going to be bringing in this this man right here who played Damn. john connor originated the role of john connor Perfect. here he is he also gets a drum roll oh here it comes here it comes are you ready i don't think you are it's michael edwards hello hey. everybody oh my god there i'm on i'm on i'm on all right <laughs> how's it going hello michael? everybody Thanks for being here <laughs> Do, doing on great on. thank you sorry to take so long it's just a bitch getting on there no, you're totally fine. You're totally fine. I'm going to make you a, a full Great. screen. So right now you're full screen. Uh, just talk to us a little bit about what this was like playing uh, John Connor in this film, because um, you've actually reprised this role in a really good short fan film called Skynet, um, which, is, yes. uh, which is linked down below in the description box. So anybody can go check that out. It's a phenomenal short film. But what was it like working on T2? It was uh, quite an experience. I, I I was dealing with martial arts in those days, and I actually af after I got the part, I asked my martial artist. I said, "What? How do I play this role? It's some kind of a crazy movie about robots and and mercury people that melt and then they come back." And he looked at me and gave me one of these real hard looks, and he said, "Be the master." And and that. <laughs> That was what I kept in my mind through the whole thing. Just stay focused. Know that you had the world on your shoulders. If you didn't come across and do your job as the general, that the world was going to uh, come to an end and my children were going to die. And so I, I went out there and I, I just was the master. And, and it, oh. was, it, was, it was amazing because I had worked 
modeling also in those days. And I had done a modeling job the day before, which was about a week before the casting. And I had, a, you know, growth on my hair and I looked kind of rugged. And so when I came to the shoot, James walked up to me and he said, what the hell have you done to your face? I want your beard. <laughs> I, he was, I was like, oh shit, I messed up. I lose the job before I get it. <laughs> And the makeup man was, I'm sorry, I can't recall his name. He said, don't worry. James, don't get kinds of stuff we'll put on his face. He'll be rugged looking. And he put some kind of shoe polish or whatever they, whatever makeup man put on you. And James was happy. And he said, now you look like my guy. And that was, <laughs> it was touch and go for a little while there. But it was, wow. it was amazing. He, he kept me in the trailer for, entire day all the way up till about three in the morning because he wanted to get me exhausted looking and, and tired and I, I was it, it did the job because I was so pissed off I was sitting there you got me here early in the morning and now it's like three o'clock the next morning and finally I get the Ed, you're, you're on the set bye Christina thank you oh, oh. Um, I'm sorry I have to pay the housekeeper Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> uh, Life happens. Patty, you have to be in the house. Yeah. Hold on a second. Let me let me get some money. Sorry, I'm so sorry, guys. No, you're no, fine. You're good. You're good. Yeah. I'll just uh, take you out until you come back. I'll just take you out for a second. Yeah. Um, but there it is. Uh, so oh, he was man. talking about you, Jeff. Obviously, the he was talking yes, about. Yes, he was. And Michael, this is Jeff Don. I'm the makeup artist on the show of the department head, and that was me. And yeah, back then we, we just threw a little bit of dark color on your beard to give you that look. Nowadays we have something called a flocker that actually takes tiny little microscopic bits of hair and glues them to your face. And we would have done that nowadays. But then of course the scar to the collodion scar that has become so synonymous with that character and all the other characters since then. Yep. All the other John Connors that are floating around. Yep. And <laughs> yeah. And even... And even when he reprised the role, because I'm not like I'm not sure how many people saw that short film uh, Skynet, but uh, they did the same similar kind of makeup on his face there. Um, here he is. Here he is. Welcome back. Uh, we were just talking about Forget that uh, short film that you did, Skynet. No, oh, that that was uh, that was really cool. The guy who shot it does a lot of short um, short films like that. And he was on my case for about a year. I said, dude, I can't do it. It's got to be, I only can work for SAG because I'm in a union. I have a pension. And finally, a year later, he could do it in SAG. So we went out to uh, a little, little park outside of Los Angeles. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. It was an old uh, place where they had an old zoo and shot it like in 20 minutes. And I thought, okay, this is not going to be much. But when I saw it, I was very impressed with his work. Yep. And um, hope James Cameron sees it one day and goes, hey, let's bring this guy back. Bye. <laughs> Sorry, this, this is a live house here today. Sorry. Yep. It was, uh, it's, it's definitely a, a, a great, uh, it's about 12 minutes long. It's, it's, a, it's yeah. not super duper long. Yes. But, uh, it is linked down below in the description box. Anybody has not seen it, uh, go check it out. It's, it's, uh, it's great stuff. Um, now, I know, Michael, you don't have the film in front of you because you are, like you said, you are on set. So, yes. um, uh, and uh, you did say you can't stay so long. So, whenever you uh, uh, stay as long as you want, if you want to leave now, right. it's, it's totally I'm, up to I'm, you. I'll, I'll probably check out, but I just, sorry it took so long. I was just trying to get into this thing. I didn't have Chrome or Firefox and all of that on oh, my computer. And, and then it said it wasn't compatible, but enjoy the movie. You guys are great. You're all wonderful creators. And uh, Eddie, thanks so much for bringing me on to this thing. I appreciate it so much. It's really, uh, Thank you, Michael. Really, and I, really hope great to be here. I hope to talk to you I hope so. Soon. I hope so. Yes. Thank you. Have a good Thank one. You. Take care, Mike. Thank you. All oh, right. man, that's cool. There he is. Now, you are you looking at the shotgun going off now? Yep. Uh, Arnold yeah. just turned around. He's looking yeah. at yeah. yeah. Yes. I remember this this guy we had. He was a you know, real biker. I'm sure he did some acting on the side, but he wasn't used to being directed. And James Cameron, who he knew, no, nobody knew who James Cameron really was back then. Jim gave him some advice, and he goes, that's not the way you would have shot a shotgun. 
you would have done it like this, you know, and everybody in the set kind of went, Ooh, he's talking to James Cameron that way, you know. And then, and then, um, okay, let's just alter it a little bit like this. And then, you know, here's this tough, tough biker dude that doesn't know who this, you know, he, he just thinks it's some sissy, you know, filmmaker, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> That's great. That's not how you shoot a shotgun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And everybody just stopped and went, Uh oh. And Jim was like, all right, cool. All right, let's do it this way. <laughs> we picked his battles. And now we're getting the introduction of the phenomenal Robert Patrick. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. when, when we shot this downtown Los Angeles, it was like four in the morning. It's going to be light soon. And there's a a, 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 a a train right there, train tracks right beyond. Right there, you can see those are train tracks on the other side of the, uh, the chain link fence. And you had commuters coming and going in and out of L.A. And all of a sudden, here's a completely naked Robert Paul <laughs> standing there and fully lit because it's a film set. Yeah. And this train very slowly pulls past. And all these faces are just looking like, what in the hell is going on? <laughs> and Robert Patrick's just standing there waving. <laughs> Hi, folks. Hi, have a good that day. Is, that is great. Could you imagine all the stories that they tell the moment they, like, they get back home or whatever? Like, I yeah. just saw a dude naked. <laughs> right. And, and you can see it's a film company because there's lights and everything there. But at yeah. the same time, it's like, what's going on? Maybe it's a porno or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a T2 porno. <laughs> yeah. like, this, you can imagine the train going by right there. Now, if anybody's watching the 4K, like I don't know if anyone's watching the 4K, but uh, this scene right here, where you can you can kind of see Robert's uh, stuff. <laughs> um, oh, uh, I never noticed that. Apparently, yeah. apparently, Cameron went back into the movie when it was re-released in theaters, and they they put like a like a rock there or something. <laughs> so hmm. it uh, it it got rid of that because apparently that's like an X-rated shot or something. <laughs> I had no idea either. I heard about yeah. that too. Yeah. I, I never even knew that. Right? <laughs> Is anyone watching the 4K? No. I just saw, I just no, saw it. Now, now, Jeff, that you do know it, now every single time you're going to be like, oh, that's wait. It. Yeah. You're like, wait, that's do it. I see it? Oh, that, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I might see it right there. Yeah. People say, oh, you did Terminator 2? Yeah, the one with the junk in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The one with the junk. <laughs> the one with the junk. That's great. Eddie, you for know, uh, David, you David, you mentioned uh, T2 porno, so I just I have to mention the penetrator. Maybe we'll do a watch along on this one. <laughs> Is Casey pulling up the T2 porno? All right, that'll be that'll be next after this. So stay tuned, everyone. The penetrator, of course, one of Arnold's favorite actresses here. He's used in several things, including yes. Aliens. Yes, that? that that still blew my mind. It was yeah. like, oh no, this is the same That's one. Crazy. I was like, wait, what? That's crazy. Yeah. She, she doesn't look so tough here. And then uh, Ed brought up, because uh, we're Walking Dead fans, and Ed was like, oh, yeah, he was in Walking Dead. I was like, what? So that yeah. blew my mind as yeah, well. Todd, that's Xander Berkeley. He played, yeah. um, who the heck did he play in The Walking Dead? What's yeah. his name? Uh, um, He's the guy that runs Hilltop. I forget the guy that runs Hilltop. Yeah. Gregory? Gregory. There we go. Gregory. That's it. Yep. Uh, so that's really cool. And here we go. Save the best for last. <laughs> Linda Hamilton. Yep. What was she coming on? All of these scenes were shot in the San Fernando Valley. So far. She, she trained far. with a like, commando, didn't she? That Israeli commando trainer. Like, yeah. she, she took it seriously. The story was that Cameron went to her and said, I'm going to do T2. You've got to come back. It's all about Sarah Connor. And she went, there's only one way I'm ever coming back. She had, she had a tough time, I think, on the first film. And she said, i got to be crazy. I'm going to play it crazy. And he was kind of like, oh, hold on, hold on. And he went away and, and you know, and that camera and processors kind of returned and he went, of course she's crazy. She's the only person on earth who knows the world is going to end. And no one believes her. You know, if you experience everything that you experience in Terminator, you're going to be nuts. So he came back and went, yeah, Linda, you're crazy. That's great. You're crazy. <laughs> and she went crazy. You're crazy. And, <laughs> and the idea, I think, in the film that he liked is that, even Linda Hamilton didn't know if she really was crazy or she was just playing crazy. They were never quite sure exactly how the role mm -hmm. worked. And that's great because we're never quite sure. Is she actually yeah. tipped over the edge or is she just kind of stressed and yeah. you know, 
how nuts is Sarah Connor in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> now, so far, uh, Jeff, you're it's like right now you're really not needed in the film, correct? Uh, well, everybody, yes and no. Keep in mind, everybody here, including the blonde woman with the glasses behind, who sticks her face in here, that's Arnold. That was Arnold's personal uh, assistant for years on many films. Anna, right there. Really? Yep. Wow. Well, Jim did that a lot with people. Hey, come here. You're going to be in the movie. <laughs> that's awesome. like that here that are, that are crew members that are in the movie. Um, but, of course, everybody... Every day goes through makeup and hair. You got to make yeah, them look yeah, like yeah. they did the day before. You know, I mean, obviously Robert Patrick's hair is very heavily styled. <laughs> it uh, looks good. He has, he has very little makeup on because he doesn't need it. And Robert trained like a madman. He was just ripped to shreds when we did those those scenes. You know, he would literally do hundreds and hundreds of sit ups a day, and was really a physical specimen. And the nicest guy, you guys probably know this because the industry talks. Robert Patrick is one of the most professional, nicest actors on the planet. Wow. Yeah. And, but I mean, he's been in, uh, uh, he was also on The Walking Dead. Michael Bean was on The Walk. It seems like everybody from Term Terminator 2 was on, or Terminator was on The Walking Dead. Um, now I'm going to pull up some photos here. Jeff sent us some photos that uh, I'm going to pull up here. And uh, we're just going to, uh, if you just want to comment on them really quickly, uh, sure. we're just going to kind of randomize this. Yes, um, this is myself and my assistant, Steve Laporte, another Academy Award winning makeup artist that helped me on Terminator 2 and 3. And we are doing an old age makeup on Linda Hamilton for the alternate ending that we never used, where it cuts forward 40, 50 years. The planet is safe. You know, we see um, a, a non-scarred um, John Connor, played by Michael Edwards, in that futuristic scene that we shot in... Uh, in in LA and uh, you know he just decided no I don't want to I don't want a happy ending like this I want to keep it open it's a good thing he did because look how many Terminator films we've had yeah I see you Casey I see you uh, <laughs> <laughs> we also have this photo right here this is a yep. good photo yeah we were all so young um, this is <laughs> Arnold after his his first round of of bullets to the face and body oh. myself on the right, and Peter Tothpal, the hairstylist for the show. <laughs> on the left, I've done 35 films with Peter. God damn it. I want that to be B. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool, man. Uh, let's see here. We got this one. Yep, yep. Arnold had uh, little kids on the way, so he was very much into the baby stuff. You can see the <laughs> in the background there. That's you know, awesome. would, Arnold, Arnold loved sitting in the makeup trailer for hours. He was, you know, there's so many times that I had him sitting there for hours now. <laughs> Here we are with Arnold behind Linda, her arms. I took. Oh my photo. God. Yeah. This is <laughs> Arnold behind Linda and Linda has her arms tucked behind her back. That, that came out so good. Did it? <laughs> I, I, I it honestly like, couldn't even tell. Polaroid. It's a double yeah. take, isn't it? Yeah. Might have been a Polaroid picture, but yeah. That's kind of freaky, isn't it? Yes, that's like perfect. Holy yeah. crap. Although nowadays there are women heavy I'm, I'm into bodybuilding and there are a lot of women who look like that. Yeah. <laughs> now now this next one I have seen on the internet. The, Arnold like, must have enjoyed doing that. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead, Ian. Go ahead. That wasn't me. Um, oh that wow. sorry, that was me yapping. Oh um, sorry, that sounded like Ian. Sorry. I think Arnold enjoyed doing that with the uh pictures there because I saw a similar one from T2 where he was doing that with Stan Winston. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ar Arnold is a fun, happy, positive guy and he likes fun, happy, positive people around him. So he's a, he's a jokester and a child and really, really enjoys time with crew. And it doesn't matter if you're a producer, a big director, a craft service or an extra, he treats you the same. This one I have seen on the internet a bunch of times. This is a yeah. very popular image right here. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Ed sent me that one. He was like, look mm -hmm. who's coming on here. <laughs> I was like, all right. I mean, God. Dave, like Dave, Casey, how does this make you feel? The guy touched Arnold's face. I know. I, I'm <laughs> jealous because like, here you are, you guys are telling like behind the scenes of making this movie. And I, the only thing I could tell you is behind the scenes of me watching this movie in theaters. <laughs> like that's it. You know? So I'm a little jealous. I uh, I can offer if there's a, I'm sure we won't have any downtime with all these specific stories, but if we do, 
I've pulled out a bunch of my favorite uh, weird, bizarre, rare items from around the world. So, Edward, since you're running this thing, if you uh, if there's ever a point where you need a little bit of filler, just let me know. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Um, like, this that's one, incredible. That's an incredible shot. Yes, yeah. <laughs> love that. That is so cool. And Arnold could not see out of that that um, right eye. You know, he was he had uh, depth perception issues because of that. I mean, look, Jeff, if there's any reason why uh, Best Makeup was won for this film, I think we're yeah. looking at it right yeah. here. <laughs> it was yes. pretty cool stuff, you know, and it was, unfortunately, Steve Laporte didn't win also. There was only two awards given, one to myself and one to Stan Winston. Stan, of course, designed this, built all of it, you know, was unbelievably instrumental along with James Cameron in, in creating it. I was the makeup department head. Um, Steve Laporte was my assistant. And we had others on the show that worked it also. And from time to time, Stan's guys would come from the shop and come and help us too. And then here's the, uh, here's Linda. Yep. <laughs> that was back in the day when all prosthetics were done out of foam latex. Oh, the same material that we used on you know, Wizard of Oz. And it was yeah. the, the status quo back in 1990. Since then, we still use foam latex, but since then, Gelatins and silicones are vastly better just because of their realism. Yeah. Man, that's great. <laughs> yeah. So, in other words, things. that's all uh, surely dissolved and gone by now. Oh, yeah. 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 The foam latex does not hold up well. And, you know, when you take the pieces off, most of the time they went in the garbage. I wish I saved them. I saved a few of them that I gave to charities years ago. Um, but, um, yeah, they, you know, at the time it's garbage. You pull it off, you throw it in the trash. And now I wish I had these. Yeah, right. <laughs> when, when I did the Star Trek films, Leonard Nimoy would always ask for the ears to come off very carefully. And he would, I would powder them and put, the, I did probably 80 of his applications over three different films for Spock. And um, he would ask for them to be put in his little Ziploc bag. And he would have those, um, he would get a lot of money for, for charities for those. I thought that was so wow. cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Magazine again. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. You can yeah, see that the typical of facial appliances are put on in multiple pieces. Yeah. A chin, a neck, each cheek, a nose, a forehead. Ear. You know, a lot of times you'll have eight to 15 or so different pieces to put together an entire age or, or, or character makeup. Wow. How long would something like that take? This took about two and a half hours for this, this level right here. Um, once he reaches the very end, it was more like four. Wow. Because then it was some wow. pretty massively, you know, torn up skin. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of these photos, I like. I don't know if anyone else has seen a lot oh, of these. Cool I have not. No, that's a good one. Because I, I took a lot of them, and you know, I've sent them <laughs> off to different places that have done articles and yeah, and such. But there's probably a lot of them here that nobody's seen. Yeah. Our crew, we barely yeah, survived. survived. <laughs> you see the guy in the front right <laughs> down at the bottom that has the dog bone around his neck? Yeah. yeah. That was our prop master. And when you'd screw up on a James Cameron film, you were boned. He was <laughs> oh. boned, <laughs> boned at the monitor. And if you slowed down production or screwed up, you get, of course, nowadays, you know, HR would be crying. Yeah. <laughs> Back then, you screwed up and you had to own it. You wore it for the day. And oh, knew you screwed up. Damn. Oh. That's <laughs> fantastic. I'll tell you, when you, when you finish you know that. Film, you're never better at your craft because you're really 24 <laughs> 7, you're thinking about it. You're living yeah. it like he is because you don't want to wear that thing. Yeah. I never wore it, but I had some embarrassing stories that happened on TV. Oh, my God. <laughs> there you are with Linda. So now I finally understand. Uh, I, I had heard stories about uh, some kind of crew t-shirts. I've never seen pictures of them, but some kind of t-shirt that said, don't bone me on it. And now I finally understand yeah, what that means. That's good. Uh, yeah. 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 Linda had a saying on T2, T3 without me. Well, <laughs> she, you know, I'm sure she said that after T1 also, but she's been in what, three films, four films now. <laughs> and you, uh, Jeff, you worked on T3. Yes, I did. Yes, I did T3 yeah. also. 
yep. with Jonathan Mostow, which was never destined to be a James Cameron. You know, it, I think it holds up well on its own, but in comparison, it doesn't, of course. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. And there's a there there there's a few more. I'm gonna mark it right here. We'll get back okay. to them. We'll we'll save some more photos for later. Okay. That's cool. Um but I'm right now we're at that uh, Arnold just here. saw John. Arnold just saw John. Oh and uh they got the good old subway cups going yep, on subway. there. <laughs> yep. Now the official so- uh, the official drink of Terminator two, the subway, the subway thirst terminator. There you go. Me, uh, I'm gonna make you a big man. Oh goddamn! Yeah, I, I still have one of those cups. Yes, that became a big. That was one of the first giant promotional things that a film had. You know, we'll use your My business, own. your cups. Give us a bunch of money. But uh, but Jeff, do you have a Arnold's Buddha? I, don't have <laughs> Arnold's Buddha. <laughs> I, I I bought this online randomly. Somebody oh, put no. Arnold's head on a Buddha. It brings me luck. I I like to rub its tummy from time to time. <laughs> okay. So uh. It's on Etsy if, if you like to have uh, one. The, the Arnold paraphernalia, I collected it for years. I had an attic and boxes and boxes full of this stuff. Every Turbo Man doll, every oh. Terminator, you know, I mean, it just it was, it, it was crazy. And you can still get this stuff. It's never ending. So I finally just gave it all away. You know, it just I kept a few things, but I thought, this is crazy. I have 12 lockers full of Arnold stuff. <laughs> Oh man, that's like heaven. <laughs> All right, so Jeff, I uh, I apologize if you you might have already just mentioned this, but my signal cut out there for a minute. But for Subway getting their stuff in the movie, I I had read that they did a bunch of catering for the movie. Do you recall if there was just tons and tons of Subway available for you guys while you were working? I I don't remember that. It doesn't mean it's not true. You know, I'm in my own world, and we have our caterer, which was fantastic, as they often are on big films. Um, were there a bunch of Subway sandwiches? Very possibly. I've been on other <laughs> films and projects, including um, Hawaii Five O, that had lots of Subway, you know, materials and spent money. So it's a big blur to me. Could have, could have very well been true. Uh, so just uh, go to the comments here. To, uh, no ticker tonight, Larry. No, no, I don't. Uh, sometimes that ticker can uh, kind of act up. I've noticed on the replay, it can kind of like lag. It's kind of weird. So no, uh, no ticker tonight. We don't need it tonight. Uh, let's see here. Okay, here we go. Uh, question for Jeff regarding the scar on John Connor's face. Were there any storyboards and how he got the scar at any point? No, just a quick note here. This is a good friend of Arnold's that gets shot here. His name is Hiro Yamagata. He's a very famous Japanese artist that makes, I mean, he owns his own island. He owns his own jet. The guy makes $100 million a year. Wow. Super nice guy. He'd show up on the set all the time with paint all over his clothes, looking like he, you know, was living on the street. And Arnold put him in the movie, said, here, you're going to take some, you're gonna take some, uh, some, some bullet hits. He said, sure. Um, the star, no, Jim just said, I want him to be messed up. And I'd done that with other things with Jim. You know, Jim is very specific when it comes to his idea and designs. But although Jim is an outstanding artist, he, he understands makeup, but he doesn't want to get too involved with this is exactly what I want. I said, let me give you something. The first thing I did, he loved. I just went big with it. It's called a collodion scar. It, it just gathers the skin together and puckers it. We still use it today. Um, the other scars in the other movies since then, including Terminator 3 that I did, were done with prosthetics that raised the skin up so you had an indentation. In there. But back then, it was fast and dirty and very, very functional. Wow. Now, right here is William Wisher, right? It There's sure William is. Wisher right there. Right there is taking the picture. Yep. <laughs> right there, Bill Wisher, who is also one of the cops in Terminator 1. Yep. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Her rider, yeah. An old, old friend of Jim's, isn't it? They used to have Sheriff yeah, Black, didn't they? back in the Roger Corman days and the, the, the Terminator days. I've, I've watched a couple of interviews that Bill does in the last few years, and he really does a good interview. He's very intelligent. Yeah. He knows the business well. He's well, well you, know what's, you know what's funny? I reached out to him because he was on the Terminator 101 podcast. And so mm-hmm. I figured I'll, I'll try to get him on for tonight. His reply back, Eddie, I'm T2'd out. <laughs> <laughs> How can anyone be T2'd out? I suppose you <laughs> yeah, right? created, created one of the co-creators. Mm-hmm. Yep. Because he, he tells a great story that 
yeah, they set up the film and Cameron was sort of convinced by Mario Casar to, to do it for $6 million, which was the most amount any director got at the time. And so he, Cameron thinks, I need William Rush's help because he helped me on the first film. And he kind of calls it, you know, and he does no preamble, just goes Terminator 2 to William Wisher. And he's kind of over, William Wisher comes over to his apartment or probably a, a house by that point with Cameron. And he just has an old yellow notepad. It's like a legal notepad with you know, one sentence written on it. John Connor is a boy and the Terminator comes back to befriend him. He goes, that's what I've got. And they had to start from there, you know, and they had to start developing outwards. And it was, I think it was a hell of a journey they went on in terms of Cameron's refusal to simply just do more Arnold, more Terminator, like T T1, refusal to just replay the same thing. Exactly what he'd done with Aliens. You know, he took the concept of Aliens mm -hmm. and said, you can't go the same route. You have to be the same world, but you've got to be something different. And of course, multiplication was the thing. Many aliens, two Terminators. And I think there was a plan, and Jeff, you may know some of this. I don't know how much in pre-production you were involved, but the original or one concept was they were going to have two Arnolds. So bad Arnold and good Arnold were going to be sent back. And I think Cameron started to worry that it would get very gimmicky. And you'd have trouble telling them apart. So you'd have to damage one, and keep the other one okay. And I think the other thing he thought, the one thing he needed to do with Terminator 2 was make Arnold an underdog. I and mean, that was about the hardest thing you could do in movies in the 80s and 90s, was somehow transform, turn Arnold into an underdog. So he said, I have to have something that was conceptually going to you know, make Arnold look weak and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. That was the biggest challenge in movies because the whole iconography <laughs> of Arnold, as you guys know, at that point was he was the toughest guy on the movie screen. Nothing yeah. could beat Arnold. Mm -hmm. So what a concept to come out of a sequel and go, I'm going to invert not only the idea of the Terminator, but the whole idea of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm going to flip it on its head and make him a vulnerable guy, or mm -hmm. a vulnerable Terminator. <laughs> yeah, the Robert, the Robert Patrick Terminator is a vastly superior Terminator. Yeah. Yeah. We, we spent weeks in these. This is in the San Fernando Valley, mostly in Northridge and Reseda. And uh, we spent weeks doing this. It's, for the most part, all practical, as you can see. The stunt driver we had for the Robert Patrick here, I had to glue little pieces of foam behind his ear to stick his ears out because Robert <laughs> Patrick's ears stick out further. So it looked like, it looked like him in a cutout, in a kind of a you know outline, which really is what matters for double. Of course, we styled his hair that way, and and we popped his ears out. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> now, Casey, you have a really good video on your channel where you uh, talk about that flip that Arnold was doing with the shotgun. And Casey's like, no. Oh yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I uh, did a whole episode on the Winchester 1887 shotgun, like the history of the. The gun itself, how it was depicted in the film, and how the flip cock worked and stuff. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That was a a really fun one to put together. It was frustrating because it was a ton of work, but I'm really happy with how it all came together. Yeah, it's great, man. It, it just looks great when he flips it around. Oh, yeah. Yep. Now, Jeff, oh, that okay. wasn't Peter Kent right there. Who? Who? No, who uh, that uh, wasn't Peter Kent. Peter Kent was the one that did the jump, the, the the bike jump. Yes. Um, Peter Kent is a good motorcycle rider, but not an expert like you want for something like this. Because that was a practical, oh, it was a practical effect. And these were gotcha. very, very dangerous. Um, That's Peter. Some scenes, um, blue screen or with rear projection. But for the most part, this was all done practically. Oh, That's Peter it. Kent right there driving out of the exploding. And that was all done practically. It was a big ass explosion. <laughs> Uh, right here, know. when he puts the shotgun back, one of the times he nailed Eddie right in the head. Yeah, he nailed him in the head. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can see it. <laughs> he almost hits him here, but not yep. quite. Yep. Uh, Whoa. It's funny. It's funny. He just hits him. <laughs> yeah. Didn't leave a mark, but it was like, ow. <laughs> we all laughed. And here we go. ILM coming there to the is. rescue. The is, is given to us. Mm hmm. It still looks good. Many, I know many many shots. Say it dates and it's you know, we now have Avatar and all these kind of leagues. That smell still looks great. You don't doubt it. Does, it. Yeah. You're in it. It does. Mm. Yep. And you, you figure that this was created from scratch. Nobody knew how to do this yeah. Yeah. back then, you know? Mimetic poly alloy. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. 
Now, Jeff, do you wish you would have uh, been able to, because I know you worked on T3, but as far as I'm aware, that was your last Terminator, right? It was. I was asked to walk work on uh, Terminator 4. I was about to start a movie with uh, Bruce Willis called Sturgeon. Um, so I wasn't able to do it because John Rosengrand and, uh, and uh, Shane Mayer uh, with uh, Legacy, which used to be Stan Winston, ended up doing it. And I think done all the films since then. And they had called me and I wasn't able to do it. Got it. Would have loved to have done it, but at the same time, I've done three Terminator films, yeah. you know? A little, little bit of sweat in his hair. That's that that oh, hair yeah. of his. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if, uh, if everybody's familiar, but but Edward Furlong became a huge star in Japan. I've got a bunch of uh, random Japanese. This is a t this is one of many, many teen magazines that he appeared on in Japan. And um, if you guys aren't aware, he even had his own album that was released only in Japan. This is a, a video <laughs> store. <laughs> really? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, I'm going to do an episode all about his uh, Japanese music career because there's a lot of fun stuff to uncover there. But he actually had two albums. The first one was called Hold On Tight. And the second one was called The Happy Prince and My Grandfather's Favorite Poems, which is clearly wow. very Japanese sounding. So they were released only in Japan and just specifically, I think, for Japanese teenage girls who still love him today. Like I still see yeah. if I'm looking at Japanese, uh, I, I spend way too much time on this weird, obscure shit. But I'll be looking <laughs> at posts from young Terminator fans in Japan who are still going and getting what they call the Edward Furlong haircut. They still today, like that's a popular haircut in Japan. <laughs> now, uh, now, Casey, which album do you prefer? <laughs> uh, I prefer Hold On Tight because it's a bit more romantic and dreamy and it kind of just okay. makes you feel like uh, you're connected to Eddie. There you go. <laughs> Which is something we all want. Exactly. Yeah. That that hair of Eddie's, Jim loved it because he was constantly in a close-up, wanting him to be a little sweaty, his hair to be a little wet, and wanting some tendrils of hair to be in his face. You'll see it constantly here. And that's Jim at the last minute getting in there and just going, all right, this is what I want. <laughs> uh, we have a question from the infiltrator for you, Jeff. Is that beast? Is that beast? <laughs> I think it's sarcasm. I think it's sarcasm. Yeah. I think it's sarcasm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. we actually have a legitimate question here from Brandon. What are you doing? Oh. Adam Jones. I don't remember him, and that's terrible because I probably worked. He sounds familiar, but I don't recall him. Unless I saw he him, was, uh, he was uh, yeah. with six people, and he would come to Adam sell. Jones went on to be the I think the bass player for the band Tool, and I think he was more in like special effects and stuff. Yeah, I'm not sure because you know J uh, Stan would show up with three to twenty people, depending on how much animatronic work with puppets and and uh, endoskeletons and, and and all of that. So, and he would be kind of in his own crew doing that where I was dealing with the makeup for mm -hmm. the most part. I would go there constantly to his shop to pick up more prosthetics and to have conversations with Stan. And I saw a lot of these people, but Stan had a giant shop that looked like, you know, a Ford assembly plant. Uh, Raman says, I actually like Salvation. Yeah, it's actually probably one of the better Terminator sequels. I, I dig it. Yeah. Uh, no kidding. He actually sung. Yes, Eddie Furlong yeah. was a singer. Yep. Uh, Laren is one of our great moderators here on the channel, so he's a uh, he's a uh, uh, very integral to the channel. Um, question for Jeff: Which film that you worked on has been the most important to you? Um, probably Terminator, because as you as you mentioned, as I think Ian mentioned earlier, that you know James Cameron. We all have a lot to be thankful for to James Cameron. I have a career. I've, uh, you know, I don't need to tell you, everyone that worked on the Terminator films, how it benefited them, especially Arnold. So, Terminator One was probably one of the most instrumental. Probably, uh, Star Trek Four about the whales was the most satisfying and enjoyable. The one that I'm most famous for, of course, is Terminator Two because it was such a big film and I won the Academy Award. So, you know, it's it. it, it you're hearing great respect and thanks from me to both James Cameron 
and and Stan Winston. Because on Terminator 1, I, I was called up to Gail Ann Hurd's house to meet Gail Ann Hurd, the producer of Terminator 1, later the wife of, 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 of Jim, um, and James Cameron, two people I never knew. I met with them. They said, great, okay, you're on. You only need to meet Stan Winston now. He's doing our makeup effects, and Stan has it in his deal that he has final say on who's going to be the makeup department. So I went to Stan and Stan knew my father, of course, I'd never met him. We had a great conversation and he said, welcome to the show, kid. So James Cameron, of course, Arnold, because I did 20 films with him, but Arnold and James Cameron are the ones who, you know, should be chiseled on my gravestone. Fantastic. Now, uh, Jeff, I have a question for you. Where is this, this Academy Award? Where is it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, it's close to hand. Okay, wait a minute. Oh, damn. Here we I go. Never, I never I out out here. Uh, right next to South oh, America. <laughs> and Look on it, it says, uh, let's see if we can get this. Look at that. Yeah, wow. Academy Award to Jeff Dawn and Stan Winston for Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Well earned, man. Fantastic. Well yep. earned. That's amazing. <laughs> How much do you see that weighing? It's very heavy. Everyone that touches it goes, that's, it, it's as heavy as it looks, thinking that it's going to be like a dumbbell, a solid dumbbell. <laughs> <laughs> you get some, you I don't some use curls. it to nails. I, I do a lot of building. Luckily, I have enough hammers. I don't have to use it. <laughs> that's but awesome. I'll tell you that. Not many people have seen that. I don't carry it around. I don't hang it from my neck. But when my kids were young, and I would go to their schools to do demonstrations and such, you know, putting beards on girls and blood on everybody and tattoos. And all this. I was the cool dad. I would bring that. And the kids loved it. They would love it. They would line up to hold it. I'd have my son or my daughter responsible for it. And they would line up to hold it. And then they'd take pictures. And they'd move on to the next. And to this day, you know, 20, 30 years later, I go into Bend, Oregon, where this was all happening. And I meet people that are now adults. They go, I remember you coming to our school when I was 12 years old and you let me hold the Academy Award. That's why that's important to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Literally everybody in the chat room is just, wow. <laughs> Beautiful, amazing. Well-earned, Jeff. Thank wow. you. Thanks for showing that, Jeff. You know, a quick that's note great. on that. I feel, I feel, of course, fortunate to have this. Who wouldn't? It would only be pure arrogance if you go, damn it, I earned that. I should have won it every year. I was fortunate to be one of the dozen people or so in the world that could have been asked to do Terminator 2 that would have won that award. Um, am I lucky? Yes, to be that person. You know, I had to have some skills to be able to bluff my way through it every day, but I was very fortunate. You know? That's awesome. Uh, one of our other great moderators, Nadia, I would find a way to show that award in every conversation I had. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's funny how many people, Jeff, bring it, bring it to the next <laughs> gathering of this. Or it's like, no, I'm not going to just, if that walks in the room first, then that's who I am, you know? Yeah. I've been, yeah. I've been on several productions over the years where nobody even knows about it. I was on, uh, I was on uh, uh, Y5O it was the makeup department head for three years until somebody yelled out on the set, damn it, Jeff, you should know better. You're an Academy Award winner. And everybody looked at me and went, what? <laughs> I love that. Let them accidentally figure it out. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm proud of it, but at the same time, I love it when that happens. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff, can you bring that to Massachusetts to me? Sure. <laughs> well, now so I can I touch it and I can feel that experience. Well, right. here, yeah. you think you think it'd be too much just to bolt it on the front of my car? <laughs> <laughs> With a hood on it? I would, I would wear it as a as a necklace, but it thing weighs ten pounds. <laughs> Well, now here's the cool thing, because Jeff sent some other photos, and that's a perfect segue. So here we go. This is from the the night of the Academy Awards that he won. Wow. Right there. Man, the great Stan Winston with you. Yep. Oh, man. That's great. Yep. Right there. Right there. And I wow. think my favorite photo that you sent. <laughs> yes. Stan won it for best makeup. Oh, wow. That's best cool. Special effects that night. And this is one of the after parties. This was at Spago's um, in LA. Yeah, it's funny, after the, after the Academy Awards, everybody goes to different restaurants. Well, needless to say, when you walk up to any restaurant and you have one of these in your hand, you go to the front of the line. 
because <laughs> they want you in there. Yeah, this guy yeah. right here, the security guard, I don't know if everybody has it on the screen. He was one of our stuntmen and one of our um, one of our um, tactical guys because he owns a tactical school. Of course, we had um, Uzi Gull. That was his name. Uzi Gull was our trainer of Linda and everybody and our actual weapons expert who was ex-Israeli um, military. Now, this scene right here in the, in the extended cut, it goes further, I think, this scene right here. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. Are you thinking of the one uh, where Dr. Silverman says, "Douglas, I don't like the patients disrupting your rooms like this." See that she takes her Thorazine, and then Douglas goes yeah. in and makes her take her Thorazine. That's earlier, isn't it? That's earlier. Yeah, that's earlier. All right. You know, you know what, Jeff? Mine may not be as heavy as yours, but I got one. Damn it! Okay, yes. look at that. There we go. For the uh, least favorite YouTuber award, <laughs> right there, man. Okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm something. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Yay! I like the applause. <laughs> no, it's nothing. <laughs> when, when we were doing these scenes in the hospital, um, which this is the actual practical hospital that you saw from the outside. Uh, we did a scene that you're probably all familiar with that was cut out with um, Michael Bean. Yeah. Yes. And yes. He comes in in a dream and sits down and says, you know, you got to do this. You've got to go protect your son. And they have a very tender moment. It was nice working with Michael again. And I guess Jim didn't have the time or just didn't, you know, feel that it was necessary in the film. But it was a nice scene. Well, that's He's why I who gives her the drive to, you got to do something now. You've done nothing for a long time. It's time to do something. That's what I like. That's why I like the extended cut to a, to a certain degree, because there mm -hmm. are those great moments like that. Um, and then there's like other moments, like the thing with the security guards that I just think is totally unnecessary. So it's sort of like you get a mixed bag when you watch the extended cut yeah. to T2, you know? I like yeah. I'm with you on the, uh... No, I, say, I like the fact Sorry. that you don't, you don't have any prelude with Sarah Connor to the arrival of the plot. I mean, she's kind of going through her thing. I just like the fact that these Terminators just kind of turn up again. And it all just starts kicking in. So the Michael Bean thing for me sort of gives her a bit of a kind of a nudge into the story. Like she's yeah. kind of fate is getting involved. I just like the fact that the first thing she sees, you know, is, is Arnold coming yeah. to her. Mm -hmm. And she goes, it's happening again. Yep. And then, of course, everything flips on its head because there's Robert Patrick as well. But um, just Which... a, a sort of sustained sequence. Yeah. And one of the things I think Cameron is peerless at, and I mean absolutely peerless, is he doesn't do action sequences. He does sustained narrative moments that contain mm -hmm. huge amounts of action. But to sort of say an action scene starts and finishes is completely wrong in Cameron terms. They are so tied in with how the story is told and how the story generates, and how peril is generated, that the action is just another storytelling tool, you know, in his vocabulary. It's just a natural outcome of what's going on. And this sequence is just, you know, it's like a sort of piece of orchestration. Yeah. How it slowly builds up to the kind of the arrival of the two Terminators. Of course, it's full of CGI as well, which was dazzling. But it's mm -hmm. just like, to appreciate the filmmaking and Cameron gets written about like he's an action director. He does blockbusters. He does this, that, and the other. But actually, he's a supremely good technician of story, if you want to put it that way. Yeah. He's, he's just, he's like Spielberg. He just has an instinct for what makes a story work visually. Of course, these, these are identical twins. This was nowadays, it's a visual effect, split screen, whatever. These were two guys that looked exactly alike. No way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yep. that's how they did it. <laughs> As we did it with Linda and her. I love them in Gremlin yeah. too. In the uh, in the in the uh, metal factory. Uh, we should say something about Earl Bowen. I mean, he's around somewhere, Earl Bowen, because he passed away quite recently, didn't he? About in the last year. And uh, Doctor Silverman is he obviously he's another kind of through line through T one. And what I love about him, he, he's just a reminder of the fact that 
while it's a very serious story and it's a very exciting story, full of these big themes, you know, apocalyptic ideas, you're still allowed to laugh in the film. You're still allowed to have fun with it. And he's kind of there just to kind of give us a kind of a, a, a reality check, as it were, that Cameron's aware how ludicrous it all is, you know, but he holds it under such control. But he still lets you, he still kind of winks slightly at you as well in the film. Is Linda doing her stuff? <laughs> yeah, what I love about uh, Earl Bowen is yeah. that in this movie, he's he's so good at giving you a little bit of comic relief, and he offers little yeah. bits of humor. But he also, at the same time, he's playing this pretty sadistic piece of shit. <laughs> and I think that's from his years. Of, so I've been working on an episode I'm going to do all about his career and stuff. And so I've been looking at all these old clips from old movies and shows that he was in and putting them all together for this thing I'm working on. And he's played all kinds of stuff, but I think he's honestly played probably more comedy than he's done serious stuff. He does comedy really well, but he's also done a lot of really good serious roles yeah. really well too. He's, he's done a whole big mixture of stuff. Mm -hmm. He was in uh, Battle Beyond the Stars. And people remember that. It's one of the first credits in Cameron's career Made at the Roger Corman studio. He's one of the alien, the, the clone aliens. If you re anyone remembers Battle Beyond the Stars, there's, there's El Bowen. He's just, he's Nestor. The N Nestor. Yeah. And yeah, that was obviously you know, where Cameron was one of the model makers. It's where he got his big break and all those kind of things. But El Bowen goes right back. We're getting, getting his arm broken now by Linda Hamilton. Uh, Caleb is asking uh, Did you receive the, uh, the Oscar from Christopher Lloyd? Yes, Christopher Lloyd and Rebecca De Morning. Cool. Wow. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Great oh. Scott. <laughs> that, that was a fun moment. They they sit all of the nominees for each category together near the aisle, so that for one, a camera person can come over and sit there and go, "Whoever stands up, they're the winner. I'm going to get them," and that you can get in and out easily. And um, when they started mentioning, okay, here's here's Star Trek, there was applause. Here's um, a Hook also, which I thought could very well win. Um, and there's applause. And then they showed the clip for Terminator. And people started hooping and hollering and clapping. I thought, wait a minute, this room is filled with Academy voters. I better get ready to stand up. <laughs> <laughs> and then oh, Stan wow. and myself rehearsed ahead of time because – you stand up there and there's a screen about 100 feet away, a large screen that says 60, 59, 58. It lets you know how much time you have. And if you hesitate for a moment or try to have another person talk, they cut you off. So wow. Stan and myself knew this. So we rehearsed ahead of time in his, his uh, um, studio where he would say what he wants to say. And at one moment that he says a certain word, he would step backwards and then I would step forward. So that it was a continuous, couldn't cut us off. And it worked. It was nice. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. This is a this woman here, the guard with the uh, uh, the dark haired woman with the hair pulled back. For some reason, I said, hey, Jim, why don't we put a, a, a cast on it? I think I just wanted to put a cast on somebody. I'd never done it before. Not, not the two part cast like you get at the prop department, but a real cast that you <laughs> put the sleeve on and you wrap it with with the fiberglass and that's the way it is for the whole day. And I did that several days with her. And at the end, Jim came to me and said, you know, that cast was a good idea because it works for when she hits Arnold in the face and breaks his sunglasses. Yeah. So that's that was just a, like, I don't know, let's just put a cast on her. And Jim said, <laughs> sure, do it. <laughs> now, now, Jeff, so I don't I'll, recall with oh. that. Was that originally, um, obviously that wouldn't have been in the script for her to have a cast, but was she still yeah. the original person to knock his sunglasses off and start him looking a little bit more human? And was in the script or not. Um, he's not as violent with her because he throws these other people potentially killing them. And with her, he just grabs her by the face and shoves her and she goes flying back. I don't know if he intended for her to do that in the first place and the cast just worked out better. But at first, when I suggested it to him, he's like, what? And then he went, yeah, good idea. Do it. I wanted to play that's the, cool. uh, I wanted Sorry, to play you, uh, 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 
wanted to play the uh, the Oscar moment here, if that's okay with you. Oh, yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so here it is right here, in case anyone hasn't seen it. I know, I, I actually don't think I've seen this, so. Stan Winston. Jeff Everybody can see that, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the Oscar goes to uh, where's the envelope? It's the envelope. I get nervous just watching this again. <laughs> <laughs> Because we were all just sitting there going, are they really out of here? Give us a hand with the envelope, please. <clears throat> oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I was going to ask you, Jeff. I was like, on a scale of 1 to 10, how nervous were you? Like above um, 10? I was, you know, I, I was nervous, but I do a lot of public speaking. Things like this don't. Oh, okay. But still, at the end of the day. Yeah, right. People are watching worldwide. Everyone you've ever known is watching. And I didn't know who was going to win. Until that moment, you know? Oh, man. There it is. Look at you right there. <laughs> You're looking spiffy. I like it. I look more like Peter Winston now. We'd like to thank Steve Laporte, Peter Toffal, all the people in my studio, especially John Rosengrant, Shane Mahan, and Richard Landon, who've been with me from the start. The guy who sat in that chair for four hours every day and made this all work, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and the brilliant director behind it all, Jim Cameron. Thank you. And I'd like to give a special thanks to the two men who made this possible for me, made this, this all happen tonight, Bob and Wes Dawn. The late Bob and West Dawn. Wherever you are, guys, this is for you. Thank you very much. Wow. There it is. <laughs> right on there, Jeff. Thank you. That's, That's amazing. Awesome. That, that felt good. I, my father was a, a, a pretty famous makeup artist, as well as my uncle, and they had passed away not that long before then. So they were so instrumental. You're not supposed to do that at the Academy Awards, but who gives a damn? You know, so you break a rule for a billion people. But now, Jeff, your uh, your great grandfather or your grandfather worked on the Wizard of Oz. My grandfather, Jack Don, was head of the MGM makeup department during that time, and was the he was the director of makeup wow. for MGM. Oh wow! During Wizard of Oz, wow. and I was thanking Bob Don and West Don, my father and uncle. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's an incredible line, man. It's an incredible line. Yeah, heritage. So much of what we did here, that shot wasn't, uh, was digital, of course, but so much of this was practical. Stan had all these crazy versions of everybody that, uh, you know, was, was very realistic to the eye. And we did it practical back in those days. Yeah. James Cameron still loves to do things practically when he can. Of course, you look at the Avatar movies and it's all, you know, so much visual effects stuff in it, but... Um, if he can do it practically, he will. Exactly. And it, like, if that's the thing, like, it still holds up till this day. Like, you just watch mm -hmm. back now, you like, you you believe it, you know? Yeah. And uh, and people to this day say like this is probably one of the greatest action movies of all time, and we've mm -hmm. had so many like crazy things with technology and whatnot, but like just practical goes such a far way if you put so much detail into it. I don't think T uh, two wasn't nominated for best picture, was it? No. Such a shame. It, it probably been. would have been nowadays. You know, yeah. we have a more diverse group of films, as you know. That uh, it, yeah, pretty crazy stuff. <laughs> You're going to see as they're driving out here backwards, and they drive over kind of a planter. If you look in the center where the rear window is, you'll see a, a lump. That is Joel Kramer, our stunt coordinator, with a with a hood on, driving it backwards. We had this thing so that it could be driven backwards and you would sit in the trunk with your head just popped out like this. You'll see it in a moment here. Um, you just look right below the window, back seat center, you'll see a little lump. And that is Joel driving this thing. 
<laughs> you can notice it when the car like spins. You'll when notice the car it when the pulls car spins. back and goes over. It's a it's a shot coming up right now. Right there. Where it drives over right. Yep. I don't know where you are. Right here. Yep. You can see there's a head there. Yep. And that's yeah, Joel that's so driving. Cool. That's so cool. And it, you can really <laughs> see it right here. Car backwards all night long without killing the crew and the cat. <laughs> that, that's a talent. That's a gift yeah. right there. <laughs> I love how he's just hanging on. <laughs> uh, let's see. Here. That's great. I'm so good. Starting to understand what it can do at this point, aren't we? We're starting to learn how formidable it is. I love that they had all these rules for it. Yeah, you know, great science fiction that you know, it couldn't just do anything. It could only reproduce it to its own mass. It couldn't do moving separate moving parts. So it couldn't be a gun. You can only have to use a gun. They really thought through what it could be, the T-1000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They gave it a kind of reality, even though it's yeah. this kind of really far-fetched idea, mimetic polyalloy, you know, things, metal that thinks for itself. Yet they gave it a, or Cameron gives it this kind of uh, underpinning of reality, he gives it a kind of uh, concept that just holds true. And I, I think that's the key to Cameron's sci-fi. It has to be believable. It, he's not interested in fantasy in, in a sense. He's very interested in, you know, it has to be in LA, has to be kind of locations we know, actors we know. And the science fiction just has to fit in with that. And it has such a kind of authenticity in that sense. You don't sit there going, oh, that wouldn't happen. That's oh, ludicrous. Yeah. Just yeah. quiet. Yeah. Yeah. James Cameron is a very scary fortune teller of the future. Yes. When you think about it, I mean, look what AI is doing nowadays. Exactly. And, and this in 84, even mimetic polyalloy, I just saw an article that they're working on this, and this is something that <laughs> – this is scary stuff. Yeah. Not <laughs> I know, right? I was actually about to ask you guys. I'm like, could you see this being a nonfiction movie? Like, just with the way how technology has grown with, like, sure. cell phones and everything and uh, artificial intelligence or deep face or what people can do online. Mm -hmm. It's yep. it's scary. Well, look at, look at the show Black Mirror, you know? Yeah. There's so many things that that show just from a few years ago started coming up as science fiction that's now become fact. Yeah. yeah. We're only six years away from when Sarah Connor predicted. Yeah, 2029. 2029. Yeah. 97. Time to squeeze a couple more Terminator films in. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we wanted to use, we, uh, they looked at, uh, using a Michael Edwards for Terminator 3, but he was too old at the time because it would have made sense now to have our John Connor in the future, who's no longer a boy, who's a man, played by the person we all knew. But he was, he unfortunately had, you know, was a little too old. Yeah. What's, uh, what's everyone's thoughts? All, like, we'll just go around. We'll, so we'll start with Dave. Uh, what's everyone's oh. thoughts on the newest Terminator film, Dark Fate? Oh damn! You put me on the spot right now. Um, I, man, honestly, like after T two, it definitely like goes up and down for me. Like I enjoy Salvation because it took a different route. Uh, it was like post war and whatnot, but I didn't really. Uh, I wasn't like the biggest fan of Genesis. So Dark Fate, I had like the lowest expectations for, but I walked out of it thinking like, all right, that was actually uh, not bad at all. So I actually uh, kind of enjoyed it. Casey. <laughs> uh, I I know two Terminator films. I love two ter Terminator films. I uh, you know. I, now I uh, I went into uh, um, Dark Fate. I, it sounds like kind of like with David. I went in with uh, not low expectations but no expectations because by that point we had had more what I, in my opinion, would consider yeah. we'd had more bad Terminator films than good ones. So I went to dark fate with no expectations, just thinking I'm just going to eat some popcorn and watch some Terminator action on the big screen. And with that, I actually ended up enjoying it somewhat. I don't think I've seen it since then, but I, I had fun with it. Um, uh, I struggle, uh, you know, post T2, I struggle with and T3. I enjoy because I think it's, it carries on the rules. It, it's not a Cameron film, but it carries on the rules. And gradually they just got more complicated 
without making any kind of great sense to me. Uh, I just thought Dark Fate missed some of the point. It missed the point that it has to be LA. It missed the point of, you know, if you're going to put Arnie, you can't make him a joke because he is the kind of Terminator and, and the, he's ironic. You can't make him a joke. And it made him a kind of joke. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know. It, it just, the, the, the new Terminator wasn't that exciting to me. It's certainly not the T-1000. And, and we're so used to CGI that we weren't that excited by it. It's a good yeah. action. You know, it's, it's got money and it's been put well together. But I, I kind of, I'm T1, T2, a bit of T3, and then I'm kind of out. Yeah. Jeff? Um, I really enjoyed the last one. I, uh, I was involved with speaking with many of the people that worked on it ahead of time, just giving them various advice that they were looking for that hadn't worked with Arnold and such. I was I had high expectations because who directed it, and of course, James Cameron being a producer on it. I think that it suffered with Jim kind of stepping away. It didn't have a James Cameron, uh, you know, fingerprint on it. I do know that they've attempted more and more comedy with these. It's kind of the Marvel DC world of let's turn this action figure into a, a, a comedy. And I don't think it works for Terminator films. They should be dark and hard. An occasional laugh once in a while. Yeah. You know? Like the scene that we've all seen that we shot that was never in it when Eddie Furlong is trying to teach Arnold how to say hasta la vista, baby, and smile and things like this. We shot it, and it was a wonderful scene, but Jim, Jim cut it out. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I liked it very much so. Um, I just didn't think it, of course, when you compare it with James Cameron, it's, yeah. it's, it's going to fail. Yeah, the true the true Terminator Three is a little thing called T two three D Battle Across Time. <laughs> yep, James yeah. Cameron. That's right. <clears throat> I think to hey, speaking guy, of T two three D, just for fun, I grabbed a couple of my favorite. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ian. I I cut out I'm, every now and then with this because I'm out in it my. It may be different now with I'm Avatar. Right? Signal. So, to this day, I think the the three D Universal t Terminator. The second the most expensive film Cameron ever made because it costs so much at that point to do that, and it's only I don't know 12 minutes long, whatever it is. I mean, you make yep. it very yeah. long, but you know, per second or per minute, it is the most expensive Terminator. Wow, yeah. Did you ever get to experience it, Ian? I did, I did. It's you know, it's kind of it's it was great for its time. The narrative was a bit crazy, wasn't it? It was a, there's a giant spider terminal. <laughs> <laughs> like, Just go million. with it, Ian. And it was like, wow. I'm going to jump in here, folks. This was one of our first days we filmed, and Eddie was as young as he's ever going to be in this film. His voice was still youthful. He was smaller. He looked more like a boy. And this whole film took over uh, six months to film. We did a scene. Somewhere in here, I don't remember where, where we had to pick up the shot later on, six months later, and we had to cut a hole in the ground because he was so much taller. <laughs> he had to stand in a little pit because he wasn't the right proportion over the car. Oh, wow. Also in this, the first day we shot, you couldn't see it when Linda was just eating a sandwich outside the car. Uh, James Cameron originally wanted Linda with a scar on her lip. So we did the scar the first day. And it just was, it looked great, but everybody went, you know, there's going to be a pain to put this on and maintain it with all the dialogue and eating and all the sweat and everything. Forget it. Let's cut it out. But it's still in the movie. <laughs> wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Tony never got to go on T2 3D. Uh, dude, you missed out. You missed yeah. out. Hey, the first time was with uh, with you, Ed. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You. <laughs> Damn, that was that's wild. Awesome. All right, uh, Casey, go ahead, because I know that there's a little lag for you. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, uh, like, wait, what? The, uh, yeah, the T2 3D thing. It, yeah, if that's what you're referring to. I uh, So I, I don't mean to be like plugging in my show or anything. I just think it's interesting. I'm going to be doing an episode someday about merchandise that was sold at the T2 3D gift shop in Japan, because T2 3D in Japan, they had a lot of their own very Japanese merchandise and some of this stuff, like this is one of my favorite things. I just recently got this. I think this is like 15 years old, but this is called a faucet buddy. You'd hook this up to your sink. And when you run the water through the little endoskeleton's head spins around. And then the other thing of that I course. grabbed, this one of my favorite weird items from the T2 3D Japanese gift shop is this 
Terminator back scratcher, or as they're called in Japan, <laughs> a grandson. <laughs> so yeah, there's there's all kinds of neat. Uh, there's an earwax picker too. I I didn't think to grab that, but there's all kinds of really neat stuff that we'll be looking at you, one of these days. You didn't grab that first, man. The earwax. <laughs> I, I, I didn't think of it. I, it just popped into my head now. I, I, I wish I would have thought of it earlier when I was rifling through stuff. God damn it, man. <laughs> uh, oh, this is a good question. Any fans of uh, the Sarah Connor Chronicles? Yes. I have not seen it, no. I saw a couple, but I didn't really keep up with it. Jeff? Um, I, I yeah, saw... I really enjoyed it one or two of the episodes i thought they were really well done i just didn't follow it gotcha. i thought that the makeup looked good the action was good you know it had a big following for a while it just i was so busy doing other films that tv wasn't in my my reality well for me personally as a hardcore uh terminator fan i don't think uh, terminator translates well to a fox television show <laughs> Uh, maybe yeah. now if they were to try it like put it on yeah, hbo yeah. or something you mm -hmm. know what i mean give it that real hard edge but fox and Fox now. <laughs> as, as you probably know, there are so many restrictions with this franchise. It's so expensive now. Yeah. Because it's gone from so many different people's hands that if you want to do a Terminator project, you have to suddenly pay James Cameron and, and, and Gail Ann Hurd and Mario Casar and Caralco and Arnold and you know all these people. It just gets crazy. Yeah. I think one of the things that I really liked about the Sarah Connor Chronicles was that uh, because it wasn't a huge budget film and they had their limits, they had a lot of those more quiet, reflective moments, like some of these moments uh, where the gang is out in the desert, which is some of my favorite stuff in T2. So it was kind of cool seeing some of that stuff in the show. They kind of had to slow down every now and then and reflect a little bit on what they were dealing with. And I, I liked those parts of the show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, earlier with this scene, every time I hear the name like Bob or like a child, I always just think of that scene where he's like, Uncle Bob. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> my, uh, my brother, his nickname was always Bob growing up. For some reason, his name isn't anything close to Bob. But now that I have a daughter, I'm just thrilled that she gets to call him Uncle Bob. <laughs> oh, my. That's, Bob. that's perfect. <laughs> Good. Uh, let's see here. Basement Blues chiming in here. I love the show and wish it would not have ended so quickly. How many oh, episodes did it have? Is uh, it two or... seasons? Was it two, two seasons? seasons? Okay. Two seasons, yeah. Two seasons, yeah. Now, did it get canceled or did it just, that was it? It got canceled. It got canceled. Yeah, it, from what I recall, I only watched it the one time and I've been really looking forward to watching it through again, but it ends on a real big cliffhanger because it just got canceled out of the blue. Ah. Uh. Man, look how ripped she is right there. <laughs> That's incredible. That was Uzi Gall training her for yeah. months ahead of time, both with weapons handling and physical her, her shape. She's always, she says the line, you know, it's, it's a lovely line that you know, in Terminator 2, you know, Arnold is more of a mother and I'm more of a Terminator. You know, they kind of, it's one of the endless yeah. ironies that the film serves up is that they switch roles essentially. Mm -hmm. She's kind of in the zone, single-minded. She's almost machine-like in the mission. And he's he's humanizing because he's got this chip and he's learning from the kid. So he's getting more and more human. So it's a fantastic kind of inversion of all the hard rules that were set up in the Terminator. Mm -hmm. And if you present that to a studio or, or to an audience going, this is what I'm going to do ahead of time, they'll just laugh to you out of you know, like, What are you doing, talking about? That's going to be ludicrous. That sounds ridiculous. Yeah, you know, it, it's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, on paper it sounds terrible, yeah. but on the screen it it was beautiful. Yes. And I, I think and I, I like too how the, the Terminator. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. His performance was what I was going to comment, or or and the character too. You know how in the first film he starts out, he doesn't have the sunglasses or anything, and he progressively becomes even more machine-like as he loses the eye and has to cover with the sunglasses. And then here, he gradually, he loses the sunglasses and gradually shows more, a little bit more expression and emotion as the film goes on. 
I love how they're complete opposite in that way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ian, when you uh, wrote this book, did you get a chance to talk to Cameron or? I have talked to Cameron. I didn't talk to him recently because he was avataring. You know, he's been avataring for, well, for 20 years, but he was avataring very intensely over the last four years. Um, I spoke to him, yeah, and I, I two hours with him. Uh, it's a little while ago now. And with James Cameron, and I'm sure wow. Jeff can, can speak much more to this than I can, you tend not to sort of ask him questions. You tend just to get answers. <laughs> it just sort of tells you things. And you kind of just, and he tells you things in, in that glorious way that James Cameron speaks, and that's kind of echoed in his films. He sort of self mythologizes. So everything is, is full of drama, and he's just full of wonderful sound bites. And so you can sort of take the history of something and just sum it up in a way you just go, that's just perfect. It's exactly what I needed, you know, just sort of enrich the story. And he's still, you know, he's still like a, a frustrated young filmmaker in a way. He hasn't let go of the young guy who came up through Roger Corman, who, who sort of fought it, his yeah. way into getting the Terminator made and all the kind of problems he had. And he hasn't sort of let go of those. And I mean that as a sort of positive. He, mm -hmm. he kind of still kind of goes, you know, I fought for this film and I fought for, you know, The Abyss and I fought for Aliens and I fought for Terminator 2. And I'm sure he's fought for Avatar and all the sequels. You know, he's still at the front line. And I just love that idea that, he can't let go of a film. You know, it's just this kind of passion for him. It's just something that drives him. I think it's a Michael Bean quote that he says, James Cameron doesn't have an ego. James Cameron's films have an ego. You know, so it's the film that's kind of shouting at, his, at everyone. It's the film that's demanding perfection. And I don't think he demands perfection from anyone more than himself. And yeah. I'm sure Jeff witnessed that. He, you know, he'll do anything on a set. And, and the story is, isn't it, Jeff, that bar the acting, he can pretty much do anything on a movie set as well as anybody. You know, who can Very do. true. That's, that's the reason when I always tell people that crew members and people don't quit James Cameron shows because he will chew into you and it'll be public and it'll be embarrassing. But you know you've screwed up. You were already going, we all get very good at hiding our screw ups, no matter what our job is. Thinking, okay, I screwed that up. No one will see. I'll just do this and this, and no one will ever know. James Cameron can spot it the minute he walks on the set. And, you know, it's embarrassing, but when you screw up and you're called on it, you just have to look in the mirror and go, all right, I'm not going to quit. I just have to get better at my job. You know, and James Cameron is, there was one time I screwed up and I, I just professed him and said, hey, look it, it was all me won't happen again. And suddenly he just backed down and said, don't worry, Jeff, we all screw up. It's cool. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you're like, whoa. <laughs> if, you, if, you want, if you want James Cameron to really chew into you, then start coming up with excuses and start trying to cover your ass and prove to him that he's wrong. <laughs> you know. Now, Dave, what if you screwed up in front of James? <laughs> Uh-oh, he's uh -oh. frozen. Uh-oh. Oh, Dave. Dave's frozen. Well, at least he's frozen with a smile. <laughs> <laughs> he looks so happy. <clears throat> Question: Is it true that um, James never, like, nothing's ever really finalized? Like, it's always like it's good for now, or like because it could always be done better. Oh, that... Jim, yeah, Jim is still going back and doing re-releases of his films where he's, you know, changing the star pattern in the sky on Titanic and removing things and adding things even to the, these movies. Um, I don't know if there's a filmmaker out there that can look at a film they did and said, I wouldn't do anything differently if I could do it all over again. The same with all of us as department heads. You know, you're generally very happy with the work you did, but if you could do it all over again, you would change it a little bit. <coughs> That was, a, that was a funny quote. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sure he'll pop back in here. He's probably freaking now, I have said, I've gone on record. I don't have any yeah. tattoos, but if I were to get a tattoo, it would be that exact etching right across my shoulders. No like, just like that. No fate. It will be made yep. for ourselves. <laughs> I've had a yep. similar thought. 
It's not an if you get a tattoo, it's when. <sighs> when I get a tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> You'll have we'll like go Arnie's together. face on your back. You know, it's a giant Terminator face across your back. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. <laughs> Dave, you were frozen at the best spot. <laughs> I know. Oh, oh, was I? Uh, all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, where did everyone go? I'm like, oh, shoot, it was me. <laughs> Sorry about that. Goddamn Wi-Fi. <clears throat> Does, has anyone ever wanted to write uh, No Fate but what we make on like a, one of those tables? <laughs> no, but I want to get it written on my back and uh, like as a tattoo. That would be cool. The real I've one seen... is a scar. Oh, <laughs> It's oh, it, it's crazy. I've, speaking of tattoos, I've seen like people do like a <laughs> endoskeleton on their like arm or whatnot as oh, like tattoos. Man. Well, dude, your sister has freaking Arnold on her. It's true. Arm. Yes, uh, I, I I can thank her for this because growing up, like my family was all about like Arnold movies and and everything. So like she showed me a photo. She's like, oh yeah, there's you, uh, Terminator Two, you know, with a t-shirt on. I was like, oh, awesome. So they would always bring you up. It was always Arnold. And uh, even now I'm applying that to like my nieces and nephews. Like if I have to babysit them, I'm like, what do you want to watch? Uh, Predator or Terminator? <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, were you ever asked to do Predator? Because I don't think you did Predator, right? I did. Well, I what happened with Predator is when we did Terminator 1, it was non-union. I was non-union. And then Arnold went on and did uh, Commando and he started Predator down in Mexico. I then got in the union and he called me and said, hey, I've got this movie, The Running Man. It's a union movie. I'd love you to be on it. So about halfway through that, he said, Jeff, I did this film called Predator and we have to go back and shoot a couple of months now because the old monster that was, of course, Jean-Claude Van Damme was in the suit, didn't work out. They shut everything down. They rewrote some things. They came back. They hired Stan Winston for one of the most famous monsters in history. And we're going to go back and we're going to refilm half the movie. Would you do it with me? So then I did. And uh, the original makeup department had Scott Edo wasn't on that. It was just me. And I didn't want to take that credit. So I thought department head is Scott Edo. He did the main movie. I came back and did a couple more months of it. So I thought, what am I going to do? So I put the credit Mud Makeup by Jefferson <laughs> Don. I was using my full first name of Jefferson back there. <laughs> I thought, oh, I'm a makeup artist. I'll do mud makeup. So I'm in the credits as mud makeup, but I, I was doing everybody on that for a couple of months. Wow. Yeah. I was, I was fortunate to be part of that. That was That's really terrific. a cool show. Yeah. Here's the, here's the great Joe Morton. Yeah. I, I love uh, it. If I ever. Oh, speaking of Joe Morton, I brought along here. I think this is the only piece of Miles Bennett Dyson merchandise ever made. This little mini mates figure. These came out in like 2008. I, I hated these things when I saw them in stores because I thought these are such dumb, cheap little toys. But then a couple years ago, I was looking at stuff on eBay as I do. And I thought, wait a minute, this is Miles Dyson. And I think it's like the only Miles Dyson thing ever made as far as I can think anyway. So yeah, I just thought that was kind of fun. I hope Joe, I love Joe Morton has one. I love having you on here. You have all this this randomness. <laughs> I love it. A, a quick note about this scene when we filmed this. <laughs> well, thank a, you. It's fun. I'm sorry. When we filmed this scene um, at Miles Dyson's home, it was a beautiful home down near Zuma Beach, which is not far from Malibu, a very ritzy area. And we're filming there all night long. We filmed there in one or two nights. And we're outside with a 223 fully automatic blasting away at like two in the morning. <laughs> I mean, you can imagine the phone calls. I don't know how they got away with it or if it was just a matter of let's get the shot and then we'll deal with all the complaints. But it's two in the morning and we're putting magazine after magazine of just <laughs> echoing through the whole neighborhood. I can't imagine those neighbors liking that. Wow. Yo, I'm back <laughs> again. Uh, sorry about that. My Wi-Fi is, is going nuts right now. And of course, Jeff had to tell me about the Predator situation. It was, my Wi-Fi was like, nah. <laughs> you don't get to listen to it. I'm like, come on! <laughs> right now. I, bastard. Yes, Predator is your favorite movie, right? It is, yes. Because uh, of all, like my favorite movie of all time is, is Predator. That is the most rewatchable uh, movie 
I, I go to. So I'm like, oh, this is great. You know, the, the, the movie with the predator. <laughs> you drop a tree on the predator's head. Yeah. <laughs> a quick story about predator. I'm sorry. I just jump off onto these, but this is a pretty good one. When Arnold is up in the tree and he has the, the, the bow and he's about to fire it. Yeah. I went up to him. Of course, he was packed with the mud. So I was constantly in his face. And I said, Arnold, you're putting the arrow over the wrong side of the boat. That's not how it goes. It goes on the other side. He goes, Jeff, if there's one thing I know, it's how to shoot archery. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, okay, how much? He said, a thousand dollars. I go, no, 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 I can't afford that. <laughs> okay, so he shoots it his way, which was the wrong way that's in the film. And later on, after we finished, he came to me on another film set and said, Jeff, I owe you $500. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, I made a lot of money. Oh, oh my God, that's great. great. In the film. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to shoot. So the archery technical advisor on the set. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, don't worry, I know how to shoot, you know, yeah. it's right there. <laughs> <laughs> Have any of you guys had the pleasure of listening to the director's commentary on Conan the Barbarian? No. I haven't, but I've heard it, good things it, about it. it. It's just, it's Arnold, he's being Arnold, and clearly they've just sort of plonked him down in front of the film without any rehearsal. And he just sort of describes what's on the screen. He doesn't yes. really give anything in the background. He just sort of goes, hit me on a horse. Like, yeah. That, 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 that's the exact way I think it was. Um, <laughs> Describing what he's looking at. Yeah. Exactly. Total Recall, I think, was another one. It was like him literally the same thing, just describing what was happening on screen. <laughs> now, Jeff, this, I think, is probably the most impressive uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Thing that I've ever seen. There's an Arnold with a knife with a blood, you know, line on it. There's no actual cut, and then now we have a prosthetic. Arnold's real arm is behind him. That's insane. That's that crazy. is so that, good. That's yeah. incredible. That would that would change the way you think of the future. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's definitely selling some Blu-ray uh, copies right there with that endoskeleton yeah. arm. And the way that Jim Morton. This is a funny scene. It taught me something about really the way that Joe Morton played that there. The, this this taught me something on film sets when it comes to a really important, precious, expensive gag that's no longer needed. We finished that, and Jim goes, all right, we got to shoot something new. Let's get all this now junk off the set so we can film, you know? And you have hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth of animatronics and really important stuff one minute, and the next minute it's just getting in the way. <laughs> it's like, you know, get that get that $100,000 hand out of the way because we have to move on here. And it's <laughs> true about a lot of things, especially filmmaking. <laughs> I love they just put a glove on it. That's how he covers it up, to, to move on. So you don't have <laughs> yeah. 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 I know, I, I think it's that is funny. Like, you just see this awesome robot hand in the next moment, just a glove on it. Well, it's like the glasses in the first Terminator film. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nobody will notice. Nothing to see here. No one cares. It's fine. Yeah. Story is moving on. Okay, now Dave and Jeff need to have an Arnold impression stand up. <laughs> uh, no, I was that was great. That well, was mine, mine, I, I used to do mine in front of Arnold when we were doing Terminator Two. We were down at the at the Kaiser uh, Film uh, Kaiser uh, Steel Factory working all nights. It's before Christmas, two thousand. I no, excuse me. I don't know if that was ninety or eighty nine. I think it was ninety, and. Um, on the radio, this is maybe two in the morning, three in the morning, because you film all night. And it was just Arnold and myself in the trailer. I was doing a touch-up. And on the radio, there was a guy saying, okay, we've got call-ins for people doing impersonations. Let's hear your best one. I look at Arnold and go, can I call? He goes, do it. So I call him, this is Arnold. How's it going? You know? And they're like, hey, buddy, that's good. Yeah, that's cool. So I was having a chat, and Arnold's cracking up. And then Arnold goes, give me the phone. <laughs> and he's talking to them. And then... And then finally, the guy's like, oh, it's pretty good. You know, what are you doing? And, and then Arnold finally came clean and said, look, at this is the real Arnold. And it took a few minutes for them to go right. But he said, we're filming Terminator 2. We're down here in, you know, in uh, Fontana, uh, filming at the old Kaiser factory and blah, blah, blah. And finally, they realized this is Arnold. They're like, oh, can we come and visit? Can you come and give us an interview? And typical Arnold, yeah, sure, fantastic. Let's, let's set it up. And it didn't happen. But uh, that was a funny moment. 
But you know what, Jeff? I got my stories too, okay? Okay. Me, me and Arnold are at Olive Garden. I'm like, you know, Arnold, isn't that great breadstick? And he's like, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's great. <laughs> I, I, before I met Arnold, when I was 19 years old and into bodybuilding and living in Northern California, not even interested in being a makeup artist yet, I was a huge Arnold fan. Of course, I'd watch Pumping Iron. I had his books. I was excited about uh, Conan coming out. And I would go to the gym and, hey, everybody, you look fantastic today, you know. And I would be, hey, Jeff, let's hear your Arnold impersonation. Little did I know, a couple of years later, I would be working with him and then have a 20-year career with him. <laughs> so be careful what you hope for. <laughs> So there's a really clever way, you know, Cameron sort of structures the sequel. And you look, you can see it in Aliens, and you can see in Terminator 2. He follows the structure of the original film, but sort of does it in different ways. And you can almost time it. So in Aliens, the action kicks in at the same point it does in Alien. There's like 45 minutes where very little happens, apart from build. And then, bam, they go into the nest, and it all hell breaks loose. And the same is true of, of Terminator 2. It's structurally it follows. And this is the equivalent of the police station scene in Terminator. You know, the famous I'll be back sequence where he goes in. And it falls in the film at roughly the same point. So he sort of strangely sort of structures a sequel along the same line. It has the same bones, as it were, as the original film. Obviously, vastly different story, vastly different budgets, vastly different settings. But underlying it is the same sort of beats he hits. So he's kind of the multiple levels in which he operates. So it is a sequel in the sense that, yeah, it does the same thing. Mm -hmm. it does it completely different. That's true. Oh. <laughs> this guy right here, Mike Muscott, he was the acting coach for Eddie Furlong. <laughs> and he's an actor also. So Jim said, hey, do you want to be a security guard? <laughs> Uh, Jeff, when was the last time you uh, spoke to, to Jim? Wow. Years ago. Years? Yeah. I mean, I've lived in Oregon now for 35 years, and he's been in L.A. and in New Zealand and all over the world. Um, I talked to uh, John Landau, his producer, before Alien, no, before um, uh, Avatar. And okay. said, well, you don't want to do this. It's just a bunch of people with dots on it. It's not a lot of fun makeup, which I would have loved to have done, but they basically talked me out of, you know, this is this is not something you'd like to do. But I, I bump into I, I just was down in LA and I missed having breakfast with Arnold. We had a screw up. I hadn't seen him in years. And I get this text once I came back here to Oregon saying, Hey, we're a few minutes late. And I went, What? So I got in touch with him. He said, Jeff, you didn't get my email. I said, I'll be at this hotel at 9 a.m. on Monday. This was last Monday. And I went, no, I never received it. I'm back up in Oregon now. I'm so sorry we missed each other, but <laughs> it wasn't meant to be. It's always fun to sit down with Arnold because we bring back good old days, you know. Yeah. Aww. That's good, isn't it? I know Avatar is spectacular and, and hugely successful and speaks to its audience. But I love Jim in the real world. I love Jim throwing around. 100%. Um, the technoir look. I just love the sense of how hard it was to do. And you can feel that in, in the heartbeat of the film. Well, that's why that's why I'm really happy that I heard that uh, apparently he's focusing on a new film, like the Hiroshima film. Did you hear about that? He's focusing oh, on... Oh, yeah. His, there's a book. I forget mm -hmm. the name of the book, but apparently he's going to direct Avatar 3, and then I believe in between 3 and 4, he wants to direct the movie about uh, Survivor's right. experience about... Yeah, that, I, he, that's a project he's had for many years, isn't it? It's been around, like something he's wanted to do. I think it's a photography book. Yep. And there's... Um, yeah. No, so that's... That excites me because that does not sound anything remotely close to Avatar. <laughs> it sounds more real world kind of thing. Yeah. I was saying, yeah, he's at his best when he's sort of fighting the elements and he's 
fight, you know, the, the, the confronting gravity and he's confronting all the things that reality throws at you and, and he's beating those things. And like, you know, the abyss is just a phenomenal piece of sort of filmmaking sort of bravura in a sense. You know, you would never do that these days. You know, I'm going to make a film underwater. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be completely underwater, and, and I'm going to put all these guys through this. But that idea of living the film as you make it, I, I think, just gives it this kind of level that you feel it. You know, it's, it's I call it the Apocalypse Now theory. It's like you can feel how hell it was to make Apocalypse Now when you watch Apocalypse Now. Mm -hmm. Apocalypse Now wouldn't be the film it is without you know coppola and all those guys going on that maddening journey up river and you can feel how terminated 2 you know they're just about to blow this building up and they really <laughs> blew this building up you know, it's going to be demolished and they blew the building up in a in a little while sort of jump ahead there's a sequence where there's the, the great highway chase and there's the helicopter coming after them with the t-1000 the helicopter and they fly this helicopter underneath a freeway bridge and they did it Improvise. I'm Jeff. I don't know if you were there, but it, they improvised it there on the set. That I did, mm -hmm. and I just think James Cameron's a guy who flies helicopters underneath freeway bridges. <laughs> That's my James Cameron. <laughs> you can over it if you want. I'm going to go <laughs> underneath the freeway. <laughs> I'm like, it's aviation rules. I mean, it was a really physically very difficult thing to do. We'll, we'll catch up with it later on. Yeah, <laughs> That's, That's it. That, yeah. that was pretty frightening to watch, and the cameraman wouldn't be part of the chase vehicle. In there, so James Cameron strapped himself to it. <laughs> of He's, done a lot. He's done a lot of shots for dangerous shots in different things. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, the infiltrator wants to know, Jeff. Uh, when was the last time you spoke to Robert? Wow, uh, many years. I was doing Hawaii Five O, and he was doing a submarine TV show over there. I forget what it was called. As a commander, um, and so we were constantly talking to people through other people. Say hi to Patrick. Say hi to Jeff. Let's get together. We never did. That would have been nice. If we, if I ever see him again, we're going to give each other one big hug, you know, because it's mm -hmm. because of what we went through. Oh, You'll see right. when Arnold turns around here, there's a quick shot. Do you see him shooting up with a minigun now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. When he turns around, you can see his back has a piece of black tape hanging off of it. It's typical of what we did for the squibs. You would cover it with black tape so you wouldn't see the, the torn up leather spot where the squib was. And when it would blow, sometimes that tape would kind of hang off. You really can't tell what it is, but when you know it's black tape and you're going to see it in a moment, you're going to go, that's black tape hanging off his back. <laughs> you know, Jim doesn't need to take that away because most huh. people have no idea what it is. Yeah. Yeah. That was one of my issues with the, uh, the, the, the 4K, all the all the shots where you can clearly tell it's Arnold's, uh, you know, Peter Kent or any yeah. of the, the doubles, they put yeah. Arnold's uh, CGI face over it. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I guess aesthetically it looks nicer, but to me, it just kind of kills the fun out of enjoying the magic of movie making when you're watching yeah, the film yeah. with their little yeah. imperfections, you know? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> did we see it yet or did, did we, we pass it? it? The, the tape. Uh, you're going to know right here. He just finished shooting the uh, grenade launcher. Now he's checking human casualties and he's about to turn around and it's a profile shot. You'll see the black tape on his back. There it is. I'm looking at oh, it. Oh, yes. Yeah. 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 There it is. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, That's... I never noticed that. That is pretty neat. That is cool. Now, every single time I've you just see that it's black tape, you can't not see it. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. <laughs> yeah that shot of the helicopter under the bridge is effing crazy yeah yeah try to do that nowadays <laughs> i got a couple things here to share with you guys uh jeff this probably isn't exciting for you because you probably had some of these uh in your vehicle am i am i cutting out maybe i'm cutting out i don't know sorry my connection's crappy out here but um this is a, uh, my understanding is that this is a, a window card that crew members would put in their vehicle so that when they were on the set, they, you know, were, they obviously belonged there and weren't just snooping. And then uh, this one isn't quite as hard to find because T2 is such a huge production. But then there's this one from the original film that I love because of this really unique artwork that 
I've never <laughs> seen anywhere else, but on these car cards. So I thought yeah. I'd share those. They're I kind don't of fun. recall the Terminator one. It was probably done post production because we filmed the truck explosion near the very end. I don't remember that one. And then the artwork for it, like that, um, was done by Jim. And uh, but the other one, the T two one, I oh, have that. Oh really? Yeah. Oh cool. Yeah, this one uh, I'm assuming was in the car of the caterer because it says caterer on the back. So someone must have been using this while they were driving food to the sets. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now it's yours, Casey. <laughs> uh, Raman wants to know, Casey, where do you get all these things? Uh, I I uh, scour the internet and I go on a lot people. of weird foreign websites. And I use a lot of Google Translate to speak languages with other people and hope that it all works <laughs> out. <laughs> oh wow! Um, are you watching the Miles Dyson about to get shot scene? Yeah. Well, the main he's already uh, been the shot. Yeah. Guy that comes up to him is uh, Mike, I think, from uh, not Mike. Uh, who was the brother on uh, Breaking Bad? Who the cop? The head of the uh, the bald oh. guy. Oh jeez. Oh yeah. Um, Never um, seen Breaking Bad. Walter's uh, brother. Yeah. 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 I, I'm literally just watching that now, too. Yeah. That's yeah. the main wow. commando guy here who is also the Hank. guy with, Hank, Hank, also the guy with a messed up face in Total Recall. Who's, oh, yeah. Uh, Houser, you should keep your, you know, you, you should keep your face out. Wow, look at that. Look who's That's... talking your face, you know. <laughs> you get a That's... good shot of, of Hank here in a moment. That's so funny because I just started, though. I was like, you know, I got to rewatch that show again. And then Al was like, holy crap, I totally forgot about that. Yeah. Uh, Dragons saying, a bit of a strange question, but if the T-1000 was in the first film, how would you go about the special effects and general portrayal of the character? Well, well they couldn't do it with the mimetic polyalloy. That's something that uh, Jim did um, after the abyss. It'd be a lot of that, that fluid motion was technology they came up with on the abyss. There you go, Dragon. Hey, well, let's see. This My best guess would be if they yeah. did that, it would have been with stop motion yeah. animation was, uh, and uh, would have looked cool at the time but wouldn't have held up today. Right. Right? I think that's where they started with T2 because when they started to explore how they were going to do the T1000, there was a talk of stop motion. But obviously they had experimented with CGI. But I think it's just a case of James Cameron calling up Dennis Muren at ILM going, I want a guy who's, you know, he's made out of mercury and he's going to morph in and out of human shape. And Dennis like, no problem, Jim, no problem. Puts the phone down. So he goes, how the hell do we do that? <laughs> and they literally had to figure it out. They literally, and it took them, I think it's right, Jeff, the, the same amount of time to do all the special, the CGI shots as the entire physical production. Mm -hmm. So while the entire physical production happened, that's the amount of time it took them to process the shots. And there aren't actually that many. I think it's like 72 shots. If you think now that Avatar 2 is something like 2,500 mm -hmm. CGI shots, it's it's relatively few. A lot of what you see in the film is actually Stan Winston. You guys disguise it so beautifully edited together that you, your brain just goes, oh, it's all CGI. It's all done that way. Um, but it was so, you know, the actual processing, because they didn't have the computers to do it. They didn't have the processors at that time. So it literally took them nine months or whatever it is to generate those shots and they were sweating on it i think right till the to the very end of the edit mm -hmm. i was just say i love this scene coming up here it's one of, one of my favorites it was like just the, him walking through the smoke with the music and the mm -hmm. uh, the gunfire yeah well, he said the line he said the line All credits. yes All credits. you'll see here when it becomes a this is arnold and then it's a torso being carried by Stan's people in a moment that starts getting shot up. Yeah. Yep. Knew that, Laren. That's a fun fact for sure. Yep. That's still Arnold, of course. There you go. And that's the prosthetic, which you can tell if you know it's coming, but still, it's pretty seamless. Because we had real squibs going off here, and you don't want to do that to your multi-million dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although I've almost killed Arnold a few times. Which <laughs> Oh. I love that gun. Every time I'm like, <laughs> I, I love this guy that's running away because then he says, Oh, it hurts. Oh, it hurts. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> uh, we were talking a minute ago about the uh, the CGI and how much it took to process those. Uh, I, I don't know if maybe it's still like this on modern films, but I'm kind of guessing. I spoke a little while back with one of the gentlemen who worked on one of the CGI shots from T2 that I'm gonna I'm gonna use that interview in a future episode of the show. So I haven't put that out, but um, he was he was explaining to me how there was one person from ILM assigned to each shot, and they worked on that shot for months until it was done. This guy worked on the final shot of the T-1000 where he's regurgitating himself and stuff. And that was all he worked on for months because it just took so much for the processing and to, to make it all work. And I thought that that was kind of interesting because I assumed it was more of an assembly line approach where one person's doing like maybe the wire framework and then another person's doing the texturing, but there was one person assigned to each shot from start to finish. And I thought that was kind of cool. That's pretty cool. Uh, Check that out. Yeah. Um, I go to school with um, somebody who is a part of like who knows like all the animation and he I can't remember his name off the top of my head so shame on me but he originally worked on the effects like of the lava um, when the T-1000 like sort of in that like molten state but I guess um during that was like one of the first uh, adaptations, I guess, that they worked on, but it got scrapped in order to make it look better. So his his huh. work was ultimately not used, like hours and hours of work not used wow. because they're like, actually, we can do this better. <laughs> wow. What a bummer for him. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I know, right? You can say, I worked on T2, kind of. Ish. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that it's looking great the the, uh, the robert oh. Patrick character coming out of the building through the window with a motorcycle was done practically we didn't have the helicopter there at the moment but um it was a stunt man that revved it up to 40 miles an hour and smashed through the window and then <laughs> had a accelerating rope attached to his body so it didn't break him in half <laughs> and, you, know, you gotta do what you gotta do yeah, it took him from 40 miles an hour down to zero in about a half a second. And then he just fell on a big stack of boxes. <laughs> like, right. don't worry, this is going to be boxes. You're yeah. good. Okay. Well, to, to watch that body going from a sitting position to... <laughs> Aim for the boxes. Yeah. With, a, with, a, with a rope pulling him this way, you know. So, he was fine. <laughs> That's good. So we're on the, the highway chase. And I'm right in thinking, and Jeff, you may be able to correct me, it's like they, they, you shut off like five and a half kilometers of, of LA freeway yeah. and sort of put these giant lights over it. And I just think that's kind of where Cameron was at. I'm going to shut down a freeway in LA. You know, <laughs> find, at least yeah. people are pretty yeah. swearing, but I can't get on the road. And, <laughs> yeah. The bridges in, uh, you know, down in uh, the Keys when we did uh, True Lies, when we had, you know, Harriers flying around and bridges blowing up. True lies. <laughs> we, had, we had people with market baskets. There is was, sorry, helicopter going under the bridge. Oh, boy. <laughs> we had people. Yeah, this is insane. <laughs> yeah, that's James Cameron filming that from the interior stuff. Both sides. They did it twice. Front oh, that's mad. He was in front of the camera car for the one going through and in behind the camera car for the... It, so, you know, I never thought about that. That's something that I don't think is mentioned much when people talk about him flying that under the there that they had to do it twice for each of those shots. I yeah. never thought about that. Yep. Because you had the camera car in the shot. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. And it was to say, when you're following this thing in a camera car and you're James Cameron strapped to the front of the camera car, you might have a helmet on. <laughs> if something goes wrong, that camera car is going right into that wreckage. Just fantastic. Now, Jeff, speaking of true lies, do you know when we're getting a Blu-ray? <laughs> Are we? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Every single time that uh, Ed and I get together, we're like, we're our true lies on Blu-ray or 4K, damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that movie is, it's its one of my favorites. It's so good. You're talking about a remake but, or a, re, you know, a, a sequel. But... Yeah. I was like, I don't care. I'll take anything because like usually if there's like a spinoff or a TV show, they'll release the original on like a Blu-ray or 4K or whatnot. So I was like, all right, give me anything. I just I just need that on Blu-ray or 4K. Okay. 
Now I'm thinking right, the, the story of him having to be a cop because they came up with the idea of the T1000 and it was going to be this kind of morphing Terminator. But it was actually Stan Winston who, who said to Cameron, you need to give it a human form. You need to have something the audience can latch on to. And Cameron then said, well, it's got to be a cop then, you know, in his anti-authoritarian way. He said, yeah, what is the symbol of kind of dehumanization? How about a cop? And that's how he sort of, they, they kind of developed this idea that you've got to turn it into a character. You know, you can't just have a, a blob chasing after these guys sort of changing shape every now and then. And it was actually Stan Winston who said, you've got to humanize the bad guy. You've got to give it the shape. Because that was the joy of the original film was the fact that, yeah, we understood it was a machine, but there was just this sort of sense of, of Arnold and character and humanity about it that made it kind of funny. There's all these scenes in, I think, the original Terminator that are kind of amplified in Terminator 2, where he just looks slightly annoyed. He sort of looks really irritated that things are going wrong. He hasn't killed Sarah Connor yet. <laughs> and it's, you know, he shouldn't do because he's a machine. He's just a washing machine, basically. Yeah. And that's kind of really played upon in, in the second <laughs> one. And Robert Patrick does it as well. He just looks kind of annoyed when things aren't quite working out. He's a kind of perfect well, man in his head. He's like, this should have been a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. And just from a logical uh, perspective, it makes sense that the T-1000 would be a cop to try to gain the trust of, you yeah. know, who, oh, yeah. who he's going after. There's uh, Peter with that mask that he was talking about. <laughs> this is a phenomenal car chase. And you think it's just another part of Terminator 2. You don't stop and go, it's the great car chase movie. But it's just phenomenal stuff. Yeah. Right. So good. And once again, it's integral to the story and every single bit yeah. of it matters. None of it is there just to say, oh, look at how fast this is. Look how big this explosion yeah. is. Every bit of it matters matters oh yeah it's, you know, it's check out it's check off rules you know you've got to have the frozen the kind of the liquid nitrogen in the tanker because that's going to play its part you've got to set up all the narrative pieces that will take us to the factory and the big showdown everything adds up there's no there's no slack in terminator 2 at all it's nope. all precisely sort of you know honed towards the story that's why i do think the theatrical cut is the is the superior of of the, the different cuts that are out there just because yeah. it has no fat on it. There's no fat yeah. whatsoever. I love this stunt. Well, this is Peter Kent here. All yeah, there's Peter. There's Peter. Yeah. That's rear screen projection. There's Peter. <laughs> Pretty brutal. Wow. I like that jump right there. Look at that. <laughs> nice. Oh, look at that flip. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. This is my favorite, the uh, the roll. <laughs> yeah. It took two times to do this. There wasn't enough top weight in it. They had to turn the vehicle upside down, pour concrete in it so that the concrete filled the top of the tank and was top heavy. Then when we did it again, it just rolled right over. It just skid and slid the first time. I'll be damned. Uh, here we go. <laughs> The uh, iconic uh, scene. Oliver brings up a good point here. Is everyone excited for Arnold's new Netflix show, Fubar? <laughs> interesting. This is our. That was our prop master, the guy that had the bone around his neck in the uh, in the crew photo earlier. Now, Jim loves putting crew members in. <laughs> there he is. He keeps on coming. Yep. The original inspiration, really, and Cameron's very open about this, is Halloween. That the Terminator was was not modeled on. You know, it, was, it was modeled on a slasher movie, and, and I always think that John Carpenter probably is his greatest influence. Although he loves Kubrick and he loves Ridley Scott and he loves Mad Max too, and all those things that sort of made him who he is. But I think John Carpenter is the kind of the telling influence because the Terminator is sort of plays in all the Halloween rules, the unstoppable killer that you. You're chasing after the resourceful girl. And you look at aliens, you think, well, it's kind of assault on Precinct 13. It's kind of the, the outside guys and how are these guys going to survive? I don't know quite where, you know, Terminator 2 kind of reflects the Carpenter career because Cameron was kind of soaring at that point. 
but the inherent rules are still there. Those kind of carpenter horror rules. I think you know, Cameron still obeys them throughout. Even like the uh, the expression on the T one thousand's face right there, like yeah. just realizing his his hand is gone, <laughs> that always cracks me up. And uh, have you guys ever seen um, Hot Shots two? Before, yeah, yeah, because yeah. there's a the scene with the bad guy, the villain, and the dog. <laughs> they uh, <laughs> like with they, they form one together. Every time I, I think of this scene, I think of the Hot Shots too. <laughs> Thing. He just said the other thing. Uh, Laren says, Jeff, you should publish a book ASAP. I'd buy it day one. <laughs> the thing people keep asking me to write a book, but of course, when you write a book about Hollywood, they want to, they don't, you know, they're not interested in all the technical and the cool stuff. They want to know who slept with who, who was doing drugs, who was an asshole. It's not my, not my thing. I don't know. We're sitting, uh, we have Ian right here. He's, he's a film author. I'm just, that's yeah. all I'm I mean, you know, I, 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 love, I love the history of it. I, I love the kind of the kind of the artistic ambition and the execution and that journey is what always, you know, I like to write about that, you know, the making and the results are always married together and just, you know, I, the anecdotal stuff, you know, that you, you could write a wonderful book about just being present on all these films and all the stuff you're kind of talking about. That well, there's so hey, many more stories I can tell yeah. with every one of these, because keep in mind, each one of these scenes were there for days. You know, there's so many moments of, of interaction between Jim and crew members and myself and cast members. What, yeah. we, what we experimented with, there was a scene when the T-1000 is walking and he ends up uh, grabbing onto a, a rail that has black and white, like caution tape on it. And his whole arm goes, oh, excuse me, black and yellow. His whole arm goes black and yellow. Yeah. And what it is, is we're starting to show that his system is failing. You know, the, 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 this new Terminator is starting to lose his mojo a little bit which we see later on at times too. But um, this was the first time when he was walking and they cut that scene out. Yeah, right here, right here. Yep. Yeah, he grabs onto this rail. Yep. Yep, we saw him start to, and then he, and his hand sticks on it. He <laughs> can't get it off. And finally he yanks it off and it, his whole arm was turned into this black and yellow. It's like, damn, I didn't want that to happen. Well, look. All I know is if we do get an Ian Nathan author Jeff Don book, I just want a credit in the in the <laughs> in the end. That's all I want. As much as we're portraying this to be 150 <laughs> degrees, it was Christmas time, yeah, yeah. freezing cold there. You know, we're I'm spritzing everybody, making them look like they're sweaty, and it literally was 34 degrees. Right? <laughs> all of these wait, the all these heat sources for the most part aren't real. There are a lot of glowing lights and a lot of plexiglass that has um you know amber colors in front of it to make it look like flowing like the the lava that arnold falls into at the end of the the molten metal was he you know, we made it 90 degrees for his comfort and it was water with about three inches of oil on the top and then lights down below it with a few chunks of of um, uh, of, um like um cork in it to make it look kind of like slag on the top so it was freezing cold, but it looked like lava. <laughs> yeah, yeah. God, I just love this. Two machines going at it. Like, <laughs> yep, this is it. Final the showdown, man. Ooh, that's what's a, what's amazing is that you know you, you kind of feel the pain, even though they're two machines. Yes, you kind of feel how battered they're getting, especially yeah. yeah. Like his hand is in there. I literally like I can vision that. You know, because it looks so real. When his hand gets crunched in it, you're like, ow, that, that's got to hurt. <laughs> you're kind of you're, you're kind of with him. And it shows you how clever the film is. He, he's humanized to the point where we're kind of feeling a pain he's probably not feeling. It's kind of, it's illogical, but it's how you you feel for the character. Right? Yep. <laughs> that uh, that reminds me of like earlier in the film. I've I always loved that line so much when he says, uh, "I sense injuries. The data could be called pain." It's yeah, such yeah. a simple little thing, but it's so poetic and beautiful when you think about it a little bit too much. I just <laughs> love that line. A little too much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Oh, look at that nice slow mo up the stairs and everything. Woo. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pull up some of the other photos uh, just so we get through all of them yeah. before, because uh, I know the movie's coming to a close here. Uh, let's see here. Where did I leave off? I think this was it. Uh, yeah, we showed, we showed that one, showed that one. Where did I stop? Hmm. Uh, okay. Oh, so maybe I, maybe I got through them all. Okay. Don't show I'm the gonna... one I'm where I'm wearing a thong, Ed. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah show it. Right. Show it. <laughs> that old Sarah. Here's some of the stock ones you sent me of uh, Michael. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. Yeah, I remember that conversation. Jim said, it's like, what happened to your beard? <laughs> quite upset. And, uh, you know, so I just added a little schmutz to kind of give it the idea. But Jim loved the scar. And then you didn't send this one to me, Jeff. I found just uh, like I just found this online. I thought it was kind of funny. Oh, yeah. That's that's Arnold and Billy Lucas in a prosthetic <laughs> from probably <laughs> T2-3D. I'm pretty sure that's T2-3D. Oh, OK. Interesting. Yeah. Look at that. It's amazing. And Canning. there's Peter. There's Peter Kent. You can see Peter is significantly larger than Arnold height-wise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that one we've all seen. And this one's uh, from T1. Yep. Oh, boy. <laughs> yep. <Good> stuff. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> so th this is all practical. All of these yeah, yeah. shots with all this stuff is other than that, you know, pulling the, the bar out. Which is another terrific example of mixing practical and CGI and using CGI sometimes to just enhance the practical stuff. I, I, I wish we'd see more of that. I think CGI, yeah. I, I'm no, you know, Hollywood person, of course, but in my opinion, CGI is best used when it's enhancing practical effects, like uh, where the wild things are a few years back. All of the outfits and stuff were real, but they used a little bit of CGI just to yeah. give them a touch of realism. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that is, yeah. It, that's nice. It, I've been in many meetings over the years, production meetings, where we'll talk about a gag and they'll say, well, what is it going to take? Well, it's going to take, you know, $10,000 for the gag. We're going to have three takes. You know, we're going to need... 30 minutes in between take if we don't get it the first time. And I suggest we shoot it on a second unit so we don't have, you know, a hundred crew members standing around costing two, three hundred thousand dollars a day. And then they go, okay, what about visual effects? Well, it's going to cost a hundred thousand dollars, but you won't move lose a second. We'll just do a, a pass of a, you know, a visual effects reflective ball on the day, and we'll do it all in post. And they love that because the scariest thing to producers and directors is not getting their day, the cost of actual production. So they will take a $100,000 visual effect shot, even if they're equal in, in, in the way they turn out, to do in post-production and not slow the production down than to take a chance of shooting, screwing up a whole day while everybody waits around. Oliver, yeah. Oliver saying for Ian, when did you get your start being a writer? Oh, wow. Well, that's a big story. Uh, we don't have probably long enough to, to do the whole thing. Um, I, I, I worked for a magazine called Empire, a film magazine. Uh, I came out of university, huge film fan, obviously. Um, determined to get into it. I've been a critic as a student. Realized, didn't realize you could earn your money doing that. It was a wonderful thing to realize. So fought my way into Empire magazine. Was there for 20 years. Edited Empire magazine, big movie magazine in London. And towards the end of my career on Empire, I started writing books because it was the next, to me, natural step. Uh, I wrote a book about Alien, the Ridley Scott movie called Alien Vault. It was my first book. It did very well. And books kind of beget books. You know, if they do all right, another book comes along. I did a book called Terminator Vault. Love it. Um, Love that Terminator Vault. Yeah, all about the film we have in front of us and the original. A great joy to write. And I've written many books since, right up to the, the recent James Cameron one. Um, and yeah, no heavy lifting involved. You know, it's been a great life. Um, it's, I've been on many movie sets. I've sort of, not to Jeff's extent, but I've, I've kind of crossed through the curtain, as they say, and I've 
to seeing the magic of it. And to this day, I sit in the cinema and the lights go down. I still feel the same excitement. You know, I still feel that kind of eagerness that I felt seven years old. You know, I, I'm a kid who seven years old, I went to see Star Wars because my dad took me and I, this spaceship flew over my head and, and onto the screen. And I went, I want more of this. What is this? You know, I'm going to live here for the rest of my life. Thank you. And I have. So it's it's been great. You know, it, it's hard work writing books and you, you try and make them good and you strive. But uh, it's also a joy, you know, watching this film again. I, it's like a million more things I want to write about it. <laughs> you say about it. Look at that. Look at that. And all that Jeff's saying. I'm going, oh, I can use that. You know, but you can't put it all in. You know, it's. <laughs> It's, it's, it's I'm telling you, crazy. please, Jeff, partner with Ian. Get this book written. I would, <laughs> I, I, I would buy a copy. I know that. Yes. I'm happy to. <laughs> we originally shot a shot here showing yeah. the Robert Patrick's character starting to glitch, where we look down at the Linda Hamilton double of him, and we see that the boots that she has on are taking on the grate of what she's standing on so that you see all these metal pieces that now look like her feet are made out of the grate. And it's just the, the system starting to glitch a little bit. And, you know, it was a cool shot, but Jim said, we don't need that. <laughs> Crazy also, everybody, stuff. everybody in the chat, we're going to be, uh, cause the movie's coming to a close here. So make sure you're voting in that poll. We're going to end the poll here soon. And then we're going to, the question is, is T2 James Cameron's greatest film? That's scary. That's scary. Yeah, that is freaky. That's terrifying. <laughs> oh, we lost but, Dave again. That was a kind of Stan Winston creation, wasn't it? The kind of yes, it was. pretzel so, man. Sort of yeah, he, man. That was he, the, had, he had all that animatronic working for him, but there was a little bit of digital on the face to give it a little more life. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. And they figured out the only, because one of the, the, the big problems for William Wisher and Jim Cameron at the beginning was how do you kill it? You know, if you created this kind of thing that's kind of unkillable and it's, it's made of metal that morphs, you can't shoot it, you can't blow it up. And they just came to this idea is that you've got to melt it. You've got to mix it with other metals and, and sort of destroy the, the poly alloy so it can't come back together. And of course, it had to finish in a factory. And and that kind of marries again with the original film that it finished in a, in a kind of metal confines of a factory. And so T2 does, you know, this, the symbolic kind of finishing point is machinery everywhere you look. And it's, it's kind of, you know, they think through this stuff, you know, they don't just make it up as they go along. They, you know, they thought it through. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love all this Arnie at the end. I need a vacation. Yeah. <laughs> They kind of let him be funny at this point. You got to give yeah. him a line. Yeah, they saved it. Yeah, I, if I remember right, I think I read that that was something that Arnold came up with there on the set. I don't think that that's in the script, the I need a vacation line, but I could be wrong there. It, it sounds like something Arnold would say. Yeah, it, it, yeah. <laughs> it does sound very Arnie, doesn't it? <laughs> Terminated. Yeah, that's a, you can see the lights underneath. That's a bunch of water, about three, four inches of baby oil, and then wow. the cork on top. <laughs> you, know, the sad, you know, the sad thing is now, because I because I've seen how they do it now, it's just a it's like a big green thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then they just fill it in with CG later. Mm -hmm. oh. Just create it and create it in the in post-production. I saw a photo recently of George Lucas in a on a soundstage with hundreds of props and practical special effects that he did with the first movies. And then the same George Lucas nowadays standing in a room with nothing but a green screen. Yeah. Sad. It is sad. It ain't the same. This is not, it's, so this is the big thing that Cameron was building towards at the very beginning. He's going to yeah. make us cry for a Terminator. His big Shane moment, you know, the kid going, don't go. Yeah. I have a feeling that's why Dave left. He didn't want to cry on <laughs> camera. Sure cry in front of us all. <laughs> it, it, it's a father figure. You know, it's just like Ian was saying that, yeah. that the roles were reversed. They're, Linda's the Terminator, and this has become more of the parent. Yeah. Father he never <laughs> had, the Terminator. 
this was the first movie that made me cry as a kid during this scene at the end here. I, I really teared up and it was the first time that uh, I, you know, before that, I thought that movies were just something that were just kind of mindless fun. It wasn't really a big deal. You put it on, you watched it and you moved on. This was the first movie that made me tear up. And I walked, I, I, I realized like, wow, movies can really be art. They can move you. They can really hit you deeply. And I think that's part of why I'm so uh, in love with this movie because of that early experience with it and how it changed the way I looked at movies. You didn't have the Bambi experience. I saw a film when I was about, I don't know, six or seven years old called Escape from the Dark. And it's all about Welsh pit, pit ponies, you know, working in the mine. They were going to blow this mine up. And one pit pony kept going back into the mine. I was just like, I, I cried for about two weeks after that film. And I can never go back and watch Escape from the Dark again because I was so traumatized by it. And that was the kind of experience that my mum had to sit me down and explain wow. to me that movies were made and the, the pony is all right it wasn't really blown up in the mind but i was you know early on and i always think that it's a theory i think bambi is the most traumatic film ever made I, no one gets over bambi yeah you, you can throw halloween you can throw texas chainsaw Man. <laughs> bambi just kills people Bambi's <laughs> Dave, Dave, look, I know why your Wi-Fi keeps disconnecting. You don't want us to see you cry on camera. Yes, that's true. I know I know now why your Wi-Fi disconnects. <laughs> it's something I can never do. <laughs> oh, God. I, I, it, it sucks, too, because, like, the Wi-Fi cut off. I was like, this is my, one of my favorite parts is when he's like, I do the vacation. Because that's every <laughs> single time I go into work. <laughs> <laughs> but like uh, this, this scene, man, it's like there's like they just show movies like where boys cry. This is where like where men yeah. cry. You know, it's such a. Uh, oh, and uh... Yep. oh god, there it is. There Thumbs up. <laughs> there. Oh, oh man! In the lava. It's, gone. it's, gone. it's it. And that, that was the real Arnold going into that soup, too. <laughs> soup. Yes. This is, um, I just wanted to show this real quick. This is uh, something Haley made right here. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Fantastic. Paint, oh, oh, painted that. Beautiful. Uh, that is. That's right. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's funny because this whole thing with Arnold where he puts his Very hand nice. up, is like, you'll see it over and over and over. It's what he's done in politics, in bodybuilding, in films photos he does that a lot that was an arnoldism yeah. <laughs> and that's it that's movie's it. done oh my god it's over it's over it's done that ian's like thank <laughs> god <laughs> <laughs> i can go to sleep <laughs> well, i know pajamas already <laughs> there it is presented yeah, in the I to you. Uh, i'll just say it, this was incredible guys thank you uh coming on here like just just growing up with it but you guys got to like just be part of it and it, that that's awesome i could listen to you guys just talk for hours honestly about this film so it's yeah. it's definitely like of my top five favorite movies of all time terry one two or or number two behind predator of course so yeah <laughs> well let's do um, the same thing for predator let's do it <laughs> i'm down so uh, we're going to just quickly hit the comments here and then we'll uh, do the thing that we do at the end of every. Um, yeah, there's Peter Kent. Yep, he's credited. Mr. Schwarzenegger. Mr. Schwarzenegger is standing. Um, and then we'll go around and we'll say, what did you think of the movie? Uh, so let's see here. Uh, this is the last comment. Uh, Laren says, love the Carpenter talk from Ian. What's your favorite Carpenter film, Ian? And anyone else who wants to chime in? Okay, I would go. If you force me to, I'll go with the thing. I think the thing, which is, I think, is an influence on Terminator Two. Um, certainly, the, the distorted creatures and the kind of. I think the thing is just a fabulous movie. Kurt Russell trapped in the, the Arctic base, just brilliant. You know. Mm -hmm. yes. Jeff, favorite Carpenter film. Favorite Carpenter film, um, probably, um, 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 oh, the one about the car, Christine. Me too. Me too. That, that wow. was different than maybe the rest of you. My father was the makeup department head on that, and he passed away during that film. Oh wow! There's a credit at the end of it that says, you know, in memory of, of Bob Dawn. So it, it means more to me than just entertainment. Yeah. Years later, wow. 
or that he was going to do uh, Ghosts of Mars. And I had never met him before. And I emailed him and said, hey, Mr. Carpenter, I'm a fan, but I also want to let you know, you know, I'm the son, a makeup artist son of, of, of Bob Dawn, Robert Dawn. I got a phone call from him a few minutes later. And he hired me for Ghosts of Mars on the spot. I had a resume that could handle it then, but then I had to turn it down to another Arnold film. But <laughs> I, I had my chance to work with him. I would have loved it, I'm sure. So wow. but, you know, Christine wow. was my favorite. Absolutely. Wow. Uh, anyone else? Dave, Casey, favorite carpenter? Ooh, uh, I'd probably have to just go with the uh, good old Mike, Michael Myers. And uh, in the thing, those two are top two for sure. I love them Casey. both. Uh, you know, every chance that I've had to watch uh, John Carpenter film, I just ended up watching Terminator 2 again. So <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen any of them. No, I, I would echo I would echo Ian's sentiments completely. The thing for me, it's, it's okay. tremendous. The, the creature work and stuff. Love it. Very cool. Horror and more. How long did Jeff say it took to shoot the whole movie? Was it six months? It was about six months. I'm sure we... James Cameron films can take up to a year because you film it with practical and that's, you know, five months or so, but then you go back for reshoot after reshoot and suddenly it's a year later that it's actually finished. There you go. Uh, Dragon says, speaking of alien, I had this conversation with someone else, but what if you were to encounter either a T-800 face to face or a xenomorph, which would be more frightening? Oh, the xenomorph. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, or T eight hundred. It would at least be Arnie, wouldn't it? It'd be Arnold's face. So that is, you know, you kind of want to get on with the T eight hundred. Maybe a bad thing to do, but the xenomorph. Yeah, that's just kind of there's something you can't, you know, reason with. Well, you can't reason with the Terminator. Michael Bean told us that, but yeah, you know, I would try to. <laughs> Still gets me every time. The first film I cried in too. Gorgeous painting, Haley. Uh, great painting, Haley. Thanks for putting the stream together, fans of something. Yeah, absolutely. Look, it was, um, uh, you know, Terminator, Arnold, James Cameron, passions of mine. So uh, I wanted to I wanted to make this one extra special. And it, it wouldn't have been extra special if anybody on this panel said no. So um, everybody said yes, and we're here. Uh, totally encapsulated it. Haley, wow. love it. Thank Big Trouble everybody. in Little China. This was so cool, fun, informative, fascinating. Thanks so much to everyone for being here. Yes, let me go end the poll real quick, and then uh, we'll get the results for uh, is this James Cameron's greatest film? I know uh, Casey probably feels like it is, but uh, he's not He's not voting. He's not voting. Uh, how do I end it? Here we are. End, end poll. poll. Uh, all right, so the results are in, and what are the results? It is 86% say hell yes, and 13% 13, 13 is that what it says? Yeah. 86% hell yeah. 13% hell no. With 75 votes. They hit the wrong button. It was a 1%. Mistake. Yeah, it was wow. <laughs> yes. Let's cancel. There so there you go. And I think it had uh, 75 uh, votes yeah, total. Just... 75 votes total. So um, A lot of people in the chat eating popcorn, slippery fingers, hit the wrong button. It happens. <laughs> That's it. Um, all right. So now we're going to go around the panel. This is the, the, the thing we do on every uh, watch along. And we just say, what did you think of the film on a rewatch? Did you did, like, do you feel differently about the film? Anything that comes to mind? Uh, the floor is yours. And we start with. Mr. Oh, damn, you got to start with me right now. Uh, no, it's just it's a classic, man. It's just it's one of the best, one of the best action movies practical CGI effects. Like it's just so well done. The actors and everything. I, I what can you say about it? It's just that goddamn good. And I loved it. I enjoyed doing this great stream with you guys. I had a blast. And uh, this made it just 10 times better uh, knowing some behind the scenes and whatnot. So thank you, guys. This was an incredible experience. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for being here, man. Uh, Casey. Uh, you know, I people have been telling me for years that I should check it out. Now that I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. Make Makeup could have been better. <laughs> uh, now, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. It's you know, it's kind of funny rewatching it for the first time, you know, from start to finish now because, like I said, I I haven't for so long because working on the show, I'm just constantly like going and pulling little clips to show and different things and stuff, and I'm constantly seeing little bits of it. So to sit down and watch it 
all the way through from start to finish, especially with such amazing company that I still really don't feel like I uh, belong a part of. Uh, this was this was a lot of fun. Thank you guys for having me along, and uh, uh, thank you to for for entertaining me with all these wonderful stories and memories and insight. This has been fun. Yes, it has definitely, uh, Mr. Ian Nathan. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I, I still love the film. I, I, it still speaks to me. Um, it's still one of the reasons I love James Cameron. But you know, we always talk about special effects and we always talk about the action. And those things are state of the art and, and fabulous and still stand up. But for me, you, know, you look at that film and you think of like the storytelling is just supreme. Yeah, from the moment it starts, from anything, it's been thought through, it's been written. Such a good screenplay, absolutely written and it delivered. And performances. I thought that's Schwarzenegger's finest hour. I think he's great. He drives that film and people go, oh, on, he's just one thing. He gives subtlety to that film and humor and he keeps it and you know, Linda Hamilton, Ed Furlong, Robert Patrick, just a, a great set of performances. I don't think that gets talked about enough, but uh, still speaks to me. Great movie. And finally, Jeff Don. Um, it was a joy. It's uh, especially watching it with so many passionate people that are so familiar with the film and Schwarzenegger in general and, and know a lot of things I don't know myself because you researched it. I know what was there on the ground at the time. And uh, I'm going to have a smile on my face for, for hours now because this is it was a fun walk down memory lane. It holds up beautifully. It's amazing that how many films that are 32, 33 years old can hold up still. Yes, we see where there are visual effects and practical effects in there, but we see that nowadays still too. So for that level of the, it really was kind of the perfect film. James Cameron clearly is a genius. He doesn't like to be thought of that way, but I mean, everything he's done is kind of the definition of that. He's also extremely brilliant, extremely artistic. He knows technically about so much, you know, whether it's a submarine or scuba diving or, or camera work or whatever, he knows more than the crew many times, literally. So am I happy I worked on it? Hell yes, you know, it's uh, it kind of walks in the room before me now. Oh, here comes the guy that did that. You know, really, He's, he did that? So that's enjoyable and I really appreciate everybody here. And of course, uh, you know, Eddie and, and, and Haley for, and Haley, I haven't met you yet, but hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> and we meet. Um, and, um, you know, I love what, what, what you've been doing here, you know, Eddie, for all these years, and I'm happy to be part of anything that you come up with in the future. And the same with the other gentlemen in the room here. Yes, yes. Please make that book happen. Please. <laughs> <laughs> please make it happen. Um, all right. So that's the, that's the stream, everybody in the chat. I hope you enjoyed it. I know this is, uh, I, I said leading up to it that, there's no, like, there's probably no way we're going to, yeah, it's our magnum opus. We're, like we're peaking right here. So it's all downhill, uh, it's all downhill from here. So. <laughs> um, but uh, just stick around. We're going to do You're a formal welcome. goodbye. We're going to do a formal goodbye, but I'm going to end the stream here. So thank you everybody that watched live. Um, if you're watching it on the replay, we appreciate you watching on the replay. Um, and go check out Durant Cinema. He has his channel linked down below. Casey two for two linked down below. Uh, please. By, by all means, check out Ian's books and definitely check out James Cameron, A Retrospective. This thing is gorgeous. Um, if you didn't live in London, Ian, I would send it to you to have it signed, <laughs> but I don't want to pay for that uh, shipping. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, and Jeff, uh, 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 what's coming up for you next that we can uh, look forward to? Um, I did a picture with um, Jon Snow, um, uh, uh, um, Kate uh, Harrington and Josh Lucas uh, ending a couple of months ago called Blood for Dust. It's kind of a cocaine running action drama done in the 90s in Billings, Montana that I just loved working on. I might be doing a project in London um, coming up, but I'm also being very selective and trying just to do one or two smaller projects a year. And I've been doing this for 42 years. I love it. Plan on doing it a few more years, but I'm being very selective now. Other than that, I'm hiking and backpacking and and such up in Portland, Oregon. There you go. Nice. I love it. 
All right, stick around. We'll do a formal goodbye. Everybody else in the chat, have a great night wherever you are in the world. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed watching T2 with us. Uh, we had a blast doing it. And uh, our famous last words, there's one thing you got to do, and that is keep being fans of, of something. something. <laughs>